across the UK, online and on DAB. It's a new frontier in broadcasting. The two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Good morning, I'm Mike Graham, he's Mike Parry. You're listening to the two mics on Talk Radio. I'm refreshed and relaxed after a week in Greece. Porky's looking as exhausted as ever after his one-man marathon last week, but I would officially like to thank him for making me look so good on the air. Coming up today, we're sorting out the world from billionaires to mermaids and who uh, we should be walking with and who we should be walking with. You can tweet us at the two mics, at Talk Radio, and you can call us as well on 0344 499 1000. Coming up later in the show is Ask Porky as well. So if you've never had a question answered live on air, now's your chance. It could be a problem, uh, it could be a piece of personal advice you're looking for, it could even be a bit of guidance on what to do uh, when your marriage is breaking down. Uh, Porky will answer that question, all you can do is tweet us at The Two Mics. You're listening to The Two Mics right here on Talk Radio. Across the UK, online and on DAB. The Two Mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Well, here we are, just hours after landing at Gatwick Airport yes. uh, in the middle of the night. Yes. Uh, here I am, back at work. What sort of a work ethic do you call that? A very good uh, morning to you, Mr. Parry. Yeah, very good morning to you, Mike. I'd like to officially thank you for being away for a week or a, or, or a bit more than a week. <laughs> thank you. So that the audience of millions to mm. whom we broadcast now know who the power in the throne, at the throne, yeah. behind the throne is, OK? Yes, certainly on the throne. Uh, not, My, what no, I would have said to this you... This is a family show. What, I would, have, what, what I would have said like to you is mm. that I had prepared a series of tweets that yes. had been sent to me while I was away mm. about your performance, which I was going to read out. Yes. But I thought, in the end, that's a bit cruel, really, so I'm not going to do that. No, no, I I'm just going to, I'm just going to say thank you very yeah. much indeed well, for standing in for us. Yeah. Uh, it was a sterling job. It certainly uh, was. I know that you're not going to be given uh, any awards for it, because mm. obviously you only win awards when you do shows with me. No, no, that's not true. Um... But, uh, but, you know, I'd, I'd yeah. like to say thank you very much indeed because you well, once said to me a great quote, yes. which is actually a football quote, yes. is it not? Yes. Uh, and I think it might be from uh, Joe Cole, mm. former England and Chelsea international. Yes. Uh, who said, uh, sometimes you play your best football when you're not on the pitch. That's right. Absolutely right. Uh, I couldn't I help mean, thinking that how apposite was yeah. that while I was sitting by well, my infinity pool yes. uh, in Rhodes. Yeah, in well, Greece. you're welcome to your infinity pool. Beautiful uh, and, place, by and the because, way. you know, for one reason, uh, the audience now know what's going on around here. Yeah, you do. have never done a talk radio show solo on your own. Why, so, why do you say so, that? Well, you haven't. No, I haven't. No, exactly. But why, what does that mean? Because I don't think you'd be able to do it. I think you would really? struggle big time. Do you remember the days when I used to do a show on my own for five hours? Uh, that was uh, on. Which, that was on another ra- a radio yeah, it station. Was it wasn't on talk radio. It was on talk. It wasn't on talk radio. Which where, had which had the highest much ratings. Select which audience. had the highest ratings mm. of an overnight show anywhere in yeah, the world. It was the only overnight show anywhere in no, the world. No, it wasn't. That's, that's why. It was up against the but BBC. But anyway, look, I don't want to bore the audience against, stiff with this. Uh, LBC. Let's. It was uh, up against uh, CNN. Let's get down to business, shall I? Let's do uh, it. When you go, well, when you say shall I, yeah. I'm back. So shall we? Uh, shall we? Yeah. Um, when normally when you go away mm. and you have a time off and you have holiday and yes. your friends stay at home and actually hold the fort, then normally the person who's been away would bring a present back for the person holding the fort. Uh-huh. Where's mine? Uh, well, I may have a present for you. Oh, you mean you may have? I may have a present for you. You mean you may have? Well, you just have to wait and well, see. Well, have you or haven't you? Well, I'm, not, I'm not going through this sort of teasing, silly teasing see, game of yours. I don't see why you need to be presented. I mean, you might mm. remember just before I went away, it was my birthday. Yeah. Uh, do you remember what you gave me? Uh, for your birthday? Yeah. You don't, uh, do you? Don't actually. No, because no. your memory it? doesn't actually last <laughs> no, no, longer no. than about three weeks. No, no. Oh, no, I know what I You gave, gave me yeah. what purported to be a bottle of malt whiskey. That's right. However, you had taken the malt whiskey out of the bottle and filled it with cold, wet, horrible tea. Well, that's only because I couldn't get the whiskey I wanted for you, so I've told you that so was you on account. So you gave me like a trick present for my birthday. Not really. Um, it, was in a, it was in a nice bottle and a nice canister. And, and you also, since I was away, mm. uh, pretty much... Every single day, mm, mm. Uh, ridiculed me, yes. uh, t- called me, you know, a fat, low-faced uh, idiot. No, I don't think I did. Used words about me which were mm. entirely detrimental. Mm. Yeah. Uh, accused me of being on the Ouzo trail every single day. Well, you said you've um, only drunk half a bottle of Ouzo no, the I time bought, you've been away. I bought half a bottle of Ouzo. What was uh, that for consumption the, at home? In what, the supermarket, yeah. In, in the few minutes you weren't in yeah. a bar somewhere. Yeah, yeah. no, I, didn't, I don't spend time that, in a bar. You seem to forget, right? I yeah. go on holiday with my children, mm. OK? That's now, never stopped you before. Well, it has, actually. You mm. don't you know stagger about in a state of complete inequality when you're in charge of children. Yes, you do. No, well, how do you know? You haven't I've got s- any. No, I've seen it happen at your house. No. I've seen it happen at your well, when house. when I'm at home, my house, that's different. Yeah. When I'm on yeah. holiday, that's entirely well, different. Well, being on well. holiday is just removing your domestic uh, clan or your domestic flock from your house to a hotel. No, we so weren't in a hotel. A we were in a very, very a nice villa, villa with an villa. infinity pool, as yeah. I keep telling you. Yeah. I know you don't know what an infinity pool is. I know exactly what an infinity what pool is. What is an infinity pool, then? An, an infinity pool is when you can't see the end of it and it looks like it goes on forever. Do you know how my son described it? 
How did he describe it? Which is brilliant. He said it's like the horizon, except you can touch it. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that great. Very good description. Yeah. Is it as big as the infinity pool that I used to lounge in on Necker Island? The I don't island, know. I've never seen a the, picture of that. Uh, sorry. You, oh, I've been in it, actually. It's well, the, you may have been in it. It's the exclusive mean... preserve of billionaire yeah. Richard Branson. Mm-hmm. When he invited me there, oh, yeah. I sat in his infinity oh, yeah. pool day after day. Did okay. You? Yeah. Didn't he have you thrown out of it? No, of course not. Well, no. I wouldn't know because I've never seen any pictures because like most of the stories yes. you tell, yes. uh, they're all in your head. They don't yeah. actually happen. Mm. And if you did have pictures, I would perhaps believe you. Mm-hmm. But what I'm going to tell you is... I is don't that, go you know, around flashing pictures of myself with my celebrity friends. Sorry, really? Mm. Well, well how, how, how many celebrity friends were you hanging out with on Monday night? Uh, Monday night, quite yeah. a few. Yeah, you sent out some pictures, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, so you said you didn't put pictures out of you and your celebrity Mac- friends. Macca and Chewbacca, did you like that one? I thought quite like that. Alan McAnally, Macca yeah. and me, Chewbacca. I was amazed that you managed yeah. to make it up to Manchester, see a game of yeah. football, yes. uh, and actually get back to London uh, uh, without any major incidents happening. Well, a few I did ma- ask our friends who were with you yes. uh, to see whether there was any trouble that you'd uh, a got few, yourself uh, into. A few major incidents did happen uh-huh. on the roads, which I'm going to tell you about a bit later in the show. This country now has basically been locked down mm. into a 50 mile an hour speed limit yeah. everywhere. Right. And I tell you what, if I got two or three tickets during that journey, I wouldn't be surprised. Really? Well, the point is that you all of a sudden you're driving along, and mm. then you see like the you know those yellow what do they call them? The yellow parrots sitting on the yellow uh, parrots. Yeah, that's what they call these. You um, see, I've got the DTs. No, no, no. That's what they call <laughs> these. Um, you know, average speed check cameras. Oh right? yeah. Called them the yellow parrots because they they look like parrots sitting on a rail, don't they, above the motorway? Oh, the new these new ones, very high up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely, mm. and. Um, the point is that they, you don't know how long they go on for. Yeah. So you're driving along at 50, thinking how long this has gone for. And sometimes it goes on for 30 miles. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, cars start speeding past you. Mm. And you think, well, they're locals. They must know more about it than me. So presumably now we're out of the uh, restricted zone because yes. there's no more signs right. and no more 50 mile an hour. Uh, uh. Can you tell if the lanes are narrower as well? Well, you can't tell anything because nobody's working on mm. any of these roads. Remember, right. I went up on a, a Sunday, right? Nobody's working on these roads. Right. So then I'm happily burning along at, you know, 75 miles an hour, yeah. which is acceptable on a motorway in this country, uh-huh. right? Yeah. And bang, you suddenly go straight under another one, but there's no sign yeah. saying that they brought back the speed reading. And this is 30 miles on from the last one. Yeah. And you don't know whether it's the same one, a new one or whatever. It's Doesn't your car tell you, when, uh, you know, on the dashboard what the speed limit is while you're driving along, though? Yeah. Well, what does it say? Well, it doesn't for temporaries, you see. That's the problem. It well, it should. Adjust. Well, no, it doesn't. No. It should do. No, because mine does. Oh, well, it, no, it didn't. And uh, and the other thing that I think is absolutely and utterly outrageous is the fact that when I got into Manchester, mm. it is even worse than parts of London for bus lanes, tram lanes, right. restricted cycle lanes. lanes, cycle lanes. Yeah. It's, and I, I, I couldn't well, have got Last time again. you went to Manchester, you were raving on about how great the tram service was. Well, that but was, that was that only because you were on the tram. I was on the tram going now to Now that you're actually in a car. No, I'm in the car. Yeah, you hate the tram. Yeah, well, I do, yeah. This, this sort of shows so, up yeah, your yeah. inconsistency no, it doesn't. and hypocrisy. It doesn't. it doesn't. I had a great car in, uh, 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 in Greece, by the way. I rented this thing called yeah. a Chevrolet Spark. A Chevrolet. Yeah. Well, you think of a Chevrolet, right? You think of this great big sort of, you know, Took this Chevy to the yeah. levee. Well, yeah. if you take taken this Chevy to the levee, you'd yeah. never have made it because right. this thing didn't go up hills. Really? It was so it's bad, brilliant. right? Brilliant, yeah. <laughs> it was like, the, I was sure the clutch was going to give out yeah. at some point. Was it an old knackered car? Well, it was a rental car, but right. unfortunately, I let mother and my children booked yeah. it. Whenever I let her book yeah. it, yeah. she always gets like the cheapest car she yeah. can find. Yeah, I see, And yeah. as soon as we were all in it with mm-hmm. the luggage... I yeah. mean, I literally stalled it going up a couple of hills yeah. because it, it wouldn't go up the hill. It's, you stalled like, the it car going would, up a hill. It wouldn't go up the hill. <laughs> it was like... Was, was this a kids. manual gearbox? Yeah, yeah. So, so did you have to keep sort of um, <laughs> changing down? Um, the only way it would change go Change down to first gear. Some, <laughs> well, some of, well, some of the hills, as you can imagine, in Greece are quite yeah. quite steep. Yeah. And the only way to get up them was in first gear. <laughs> right. And it yeah. was like... <laughs> 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 yeah. Absolutely horrendous. And the kids were like... Yeah. You know, because when we went to Sicily last year, they said, Daddy, can you please book the car this time? I and mean, I got right, rather yeah. a nice open top sort of sports yeah, car. Sure, yeah. But they, they, were, they were very embarrassed. Yeah, like this you know, car. They I'm insisted on, on taking taxis everywhere because they were like, we can't be seen in this car. So what's roads like? Roads is beautiful. Yeah. It really is, I have okay. to say. And not, I mean, we're talking about traffic jams. Mm. Not one traffic jam mm. did I see. I mean, people drive in a slightly erratic way. Yeah. And there's a lot, quite a lot of coaches. But yeah, there's sure. a town called Lindos, mm. which is gorgeous. Big. Well, you might have seen some of the pieces I put out. It's, it's all it houses are all painted white. Is Lindos the capital of Rhodes? No, Rhodes Town is the capital of oh, Rhodes. This is kind of down and it's more of a resort town. Right, OK. And it's all on a hill. Yeah. It's, it's, it's all pedestrianised. Yeah. It's beautiful. It's really, I had a great yeah. time. I yeah. must admit, I've never been to Greece before. Right. And I'm definitely going to go back again. Oh, really? Because it was fantastic. What was the economy like? The economy was absolutely fine. In fact, um, my sister was was texting me at one point because yeah. she used to go there quite a lot as a, as a teenager. Right. And she said, the thing I love about Greece is it's quite cheap. Well, mm. it wasn't cheap. Mm. Not where I was going anyway. Some of the places we had dinner
Um, you know, it was as much money as you'd pay in London. Well, that's the pound euro problem. Well, probably, yeah. Well, I think yesterday when I was flying back, mm. the pound hit its lowest point ever yeah, against the euro. Yeah, about 108. Yeah. And, and at the airports before you're going out, you're getting about 88 or something. Well, the one thing that I did think was awful, actually, was mm. Rhodes Airport. Rhodes Airport, if you're ever flying through it, yeah. don't ever go there hungry because right. they've got the worst canteen sort of scenario you've ever seen really? in your life. Yeah. And it was horrendous, yeah. Doesn't sound good. Where'd you pick the car up from? Uh, the car was at Rhodes Airport. Was that a problem? You picked it up? Oh, yeah, it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. That was fine. It was just that when it got to coming going up and down hills it yeah. wasn't so good no okay fine because there's been a lot of stories while you've been away about people returning uh home and uh and not... oh you mean when i came back to get my car here well no i meant in roads really but i was going to say to you the the stories about uh, uh there's another one this morning yeah. about uh, 130 car keys stolen really? horrified families returning from holidays abroad to find their cars stolen after a raid on a meet and greet airport parking company these people just burst into the office and took the keys and then tried to find the cars to nick them. Yeah, right. Well, funnily enough, I came back, got the car last night. It was about midnight. Yeah. Um, and they were all very nice. It was at the valet parking place at Gatwick. Yes. Uh, in fact, a guy said he saw me there on Twitter, but he didn't want to say anything to me because I looked a bit lost. Yeah. And the reason I looked a bit lost was because they you said just had me, a week on the Uso. Well, no, it wasn't that. It was they yeah, said was. to me, your car yeah. is in bay number 75, right. H, right? Yeah. Went to H75 yeah. and it wasn't there. No, ba- no car. So I thought, well, hang on. Well, somebody's either taken the car yeah. or you put it somewhere I can't find it. I had mm. to do that Jason Ball thing walking around the car park and did know, it work it. yeah really yeah i finally found it, wow. it was about two uh, two levels down uh, do uh, you know when you press your key fob yeah. and all that yeah does that only register to one car in yep. the world are you yeah. sure it can't open the yeah. doors of other cars absolutely no it can't no, no. no. Okay. that's why i mean you should know this because you've got the same make of car yes because this was my other half's car yes and i mean you know the, if if you lose the key yeah it costs about 100 quid to get another it one does, done yeah because it's, a unique, it's got a unique yeah. code yeah. yeah anyway here's a quick tweet for you from johnny yes Hawkey wasn't chucked out of branson's pool because there wasn't a nearby crane yeah oh, 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 that's very <laughs> funny isn't it you know i've never heard that joke before really? beached whales and all that yeah. now i think i should remind you seen the time by the way well let me just I remind mean, how on earth did you ever hit the news let me just remind you and the audience yeah right? go on. without you last week yeah the first time ever uh-huh. we, we had got, no listeners we, we we got uh multiple calls on this show so did i'm going to give the number out okay because okay, people on, now are used to calling oh, look, in okay we've got a guest uh, yeah. showed up here we go here he is mr alan brazil monsieur brazil what a pleasure to see you have you told them Sit down, uh, please. You, Sit down. Have you told them the stick that you gave them while he's away? Well, I, well, I, didn't, luckily, I didn't give him any Luckily, stick. I saw on Twitter that people were saying every so you couldn't do you couldn't do five minutes without mentioning me. I thought that's terrible. There you were, yeah. lazing by the pool, yeah. sipping a cocktail, and exactly. he's slagging you off. Yeah, I was slagging him. Uh, he's filled himself full of ouzo while he was away. Just look at that face. Yeah, I mean, I've had that a, face I mean, look twice do, as big as it was before <laughs> he went away. Do I look as if I've had a great time? And does he not look closer to death than ever? No, I do not look hey? closer to death than ever. Yeah, but he doesn't have holidays. No, no, he needs to. He needs to take a holiday. No. No, I don't. You know what I'm worried about is he's actually a miser. A he doesn't miser. want to spend oh, any money. Oh, yeah. so you must have come across yeah. that before. He doesn't uh, want to spend any uh, money uh, going anywhere. Hey, come off it. Oh, tons sale pockets. Yeah, yeah. Do you, I, do you mind? That's one thing I certainly am not. I'm not a miser. You, you don't want to spend the it. money, do you? Eh? You just don't want to spend the money. It's not that at all. I only get chucked out of Man City the other night. I yeah, I heard about that. Yeah, I dare you say I heard about that. Absolutely. And you did a show. Thank you for holding the fort on Saturday, by the way. No problem at all. You know, I don't want him losing listeners from here, but I really don't want him losing listeners from over there. I think you should know. I didn't want to tell you, Mr. Brazil's here, that it was said by millions and millions mm. of our listeners that the warm-up last Saturday, yeah. that was myself and Mr. Yeah. Brazil, was the greatest warm-up show they'd ever oh, heard. Oh, I don't remember seeing that. Yeah, no. yeah, 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 yeah. Was that before or after you fired him? <laughs> Sorry, what do you want? Before or after you fired him? Are you mad? How many times have you fired Alan Brazil? Twice. Twice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, but he's still here. He's a great survivor. Thank you, Al. Yeah. Uh, that was, of course, the legendary Alan Brazil. It certainly was. Mr. Mike Parry was about to give the number out, but hurry, because we're nearly half past uh, ten already. OK, folks. 0344. Yes. 499. Hold on. 1,000. I want to hear from some of you out there who don't run away on holiday every time it gets tough. This is Talk Radio. The 21st century dream team of dialogue, debate and discourse. The two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Talk Radio, we are the two mics. I'm back from holiday. Porky never went away, as most of you will know. But, yep. uh, you know, normal service has now been resumed, as many people have said on Twitter. We've got lots of tweets. Keep them coming in, please, at the two mics. You can also, uh, of course, text us at 87222. Start your message with the word talk. Now, uh, you've been telling me this morning, because, yep. of course, being away... You tend not to follow the news in quite the same way as you do uh, when you're actually back here working. Yeah, but there's, so, there's no reason this, in this day and age why you shouldn't. Because if, no, you've, got, if you've got a tab with you, which I presume you took with you, I you mean, 
mean an iPad. An iPad. Yeah. You're in touch with everything, aren't you? All well, the time. you are. But the thing, yeah. the thing is, I was listening to Paul Ross earlier mm. on this morning, and he was mm. talking um, about the fact that you know everywhere you go now, people are in touch with you. You know, yes. if you don't get hold of somebody, I was, in fact, I was listening to Ian Lee last night as well on the way back from the airport. Uh, where mm. you're saying, look, you know, if somebody mm. doesn't answer a text within 10 minutes, you think there's something wrong. Yeah. Because we're now in touch with everybody all the time. Yeah, no, that's, and, uh, that's, that's well, absolutely of, true, actually. I was of, trying to get hold of somebody the other night, yeah. so I did interrupt there, and it was important. And I said, why aren't you replying to me? And mm. they were actually on an aeroplane yeah, flying right. off on holiday themselves. Well, exactly. And so the point yeah. is, is that one of the things I try to do, mm. and it's difficult because mm. we run a, mm. uh, you know, a Twitter account, we run a business, there's all these things going on, announcements being made. Yeah. Um, it's very difficult, but I try when I go away to, to spend at least a few mm. hours just not looking at it. Mm. Mm. Because otherwise, you know, all you do is you're, totally you're, agree. you're, you're working, but you're just in a different location. Yep. Well, let's talk to Dr. Yvonne Doyle, who's Regional Indeed. Director at Public Health England, because there's a story around that you were telling me this morning yeah. saying that everybody should do a lot more exercise. Definitely. Uh, and you're always claiming to do loads of exercise. So I let's do. find out from Dr. Doyle yeah. uh, what's going on. Dr. Doyle, a very good morning to you. Good morning, Mike. Thank yeah. you very much for joining us. Sorry to keep you waiting, but uh, we've got a lot no to talk about because I've been away for a, a week in uh, Greece, mm. which was fantastic. And I did a lot of <laughs> swimming, actually, uh, which is something I would do a lot more of at home if I had a swimming pool, but I don't, sadly. Um, what's the story here? Why are people not doing enough exercise? Probably because they're very busy, Mike, and they think they can't fit this in anywhere. And, you know, they're squeezed. This kind of age 40 to 60 year old, um, you know, they're looking after, they're still looking after family. If they're looking after older people, perhaps they're working and life is very busy. So they've kind of squeezed themselves out of looking after their health. And we now know that actually uh, about 6 million people don't even do 10 minutes, 10 minutes a month of brisk exercise. So we're trying to encourage people to do that. It's simple. It's not about getting into Lycra and going down to the gym. It's very mm. much about taking a brisk walk for mm. 10 minutes. Doc, Doc, I can't understand these figures. 6.3 million people aged between 40 and 60 say they've not walked at a brisk pace for 10 minutes continuously in the past month. Don't these people even walk to the bus stop? Don't they walk to the railway station? Don't they walk to the shops? Don't they, you know, just walk up the road? I mean, surely, do we have people who spend all their lives sitting on a couch? Yeah, well, this is what they say themselves, uh, Mike, that uh, they drive and they um, they they don't do these things. Mm. You know, they kind of sit around a lot. Um, I think people probably do a bit more than they realise, but the point of this bit is that they yeah. have to do 10 minutes brisk exercise to get your heart rate up. And yes. walking will do it. So long as you know, you just think, uh, this is my 10 minutes for me, yeah. um, you're in there. Yeah. See, I, I walk quite a lot. I've had a history of uh, of acute heart failure. I've got dilated <laughs> cardiomyopathy. Why do you have to I'm tell a, everybody that? Well, well because, Why? because we're talking to a doctor and she will appreciate me putting into context. <sighs> yeah, and, I, yeah. and I have to say, Doc, I walk to stay alive because I exactly. feel to, in myself, if I didn't walk, I wouldn't feel I could breathe properly, walk upstairs and, and all that. I mean, can't people get that into their head that the longer they walk, the longer they'll probably live? Yeah, and actually, if you do 10 minutes every day of brisk walking, mm. uh, you'll reduce all sorts of problems already by about 15%. Yes. And the, and the more you walk, if you do 150 minutes a week, which mm. is really only two hours a week, you've reduced all sorts of big problems. Yeah. Um, you know, like what you're describing, actually, my yes. heart disease, but other things too. Yes. My father yes. used to walk everywhere, you know. In fact, he was often yeah. picked up by the police on uh, Highway 95 in yeah. America. I know that. I didn't uh, know because, where he was going sometimes. No, because unfortunately he suffered from dementia. I know, this is terribly um, sad. Uh, and, uh, mm. you know, so, I mean, it doesn't Should ward... Have a, bit, it doesn't, a better eye Well, it doesn't ward off every problem, does mm. it? I mean, you can be physically OK, but mm. it doesn't necessarily uh, help you mentally. Yeah, well, this is the thing. And walking does actually do both. It, of course it, it does. It makes you feel better. Yeah. You're, you're, you're better in your mind and your body's benefiting. And, and Mike, can I just say, there is an app, uh, an Active 10 app, mm. which is free, and you can download it. And I know people have lots of apps, but this one is free and it's aimed at this age group. And it tells you whether you've done your 10 minutes brisk. Mm. And it's really good. I use it myself and it's, quite, it's very motivational. Mm. Absolutely. You, what you said about going to the gym and Lycra and all that is so uh, apposite, Doctor, because people think... I, you see, I think there's a, a certain amount of um, you know ego and snobbery about putting on Lycra and going to a gym and being well, seen... Well, I wouldn't want to see you in any Lycra. No, no, neither would I. Uh, you know, being seen on a on a you know a treadmill or a bike or something like that. Yeah. Whereas in yeah. fact, in fact, as you quite rightly say, walking is even better than jogging, isn't it? Because jogging yeah. knackers all your knees and ankles and everything, doesn't it? 
Absolutely. You're, be- you're much better off to do something that you can just build into yeah. every day. Yeah. It's not a burden and you've done it. And when you've done it, you, you feel better. Yeah. Now, one of the things that makes life easier as well these days, you talk about a free app. I mean, most people who've got an iPhone mm. have got a sort of a health section on that iPhone. I'm looking at mine here. Yeah. And already today, what does it say? Uh, I've walked... You're overweight, fat and not going to live long. Uh, no, that says that's the guy I'm working with. <laughs> uh, it says walking and running distance so far today, 1.2 kilometres, which is not bad. Mm. Mm. Steps, yeah. 1,637. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And I've done four floors already climbing stairs. Yeah. Fantastic. That's all right. And it's only 10 o'clock, 10.30. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. How That's many have fantastic. you done, Porky? Sorry? Where's your statistics? My statistics yeah, are on. fine. I've walked, oh, da- I've walked down. What does your phone say? I haven't looked at it because I don't need to. No, I know see, in my head he what I've done. Of lies, I've Dr. walked Doyle. down from London Bridge Station to here this morning, 22 really? minutes of walking, Doctor. 22 from minutes from yeah. London Bridge? Yeah. From I'll do that in 10. Uh, no, you couldn't. Yeah, I can. No, you couldn't. I walk it regularly. Take a shortcut. Um, thing is, Doc. You don't stop at Weatherspoons. Thing is, Doc, that we all know what we should be doing, but are we getting the message across across to these people? Across, across. You said it is Steve McLaren. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, this is it. Yeah. So you don't have to be more far up. But I think the first steps are the most difficult. Once you've got the hang of this, yep. it, it's that you just do it out of habit and you're done. I totally but agree. I think a lot of people think they can't. And the message is, this is really simple. Just yeah. get your 10 minutes in somewhere during your day. Yeah. Do you know what I think we should do, Doc? You know, uh, people over the age of 60 apparently get free bus passes. Certainly in London they do, I think. You uh-huh. should, you should take, take them away. Yeah, take them away. <laughs> Take them away, and then and then they, you know, some people use them to go one stop or two it's stops true, or something. Actually, yeah, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, take them away and, and and make them walk, or put a charge on them, you know, a minimal charge of ten pounds a month or something. And because when you give somebody well, that's an a easy bit harsh. way out, you don't want to start no, charging no. pensioners. When you give somebody an easy way out, they take the easy way out, and it's easier for them to wait at the bus stop at the bottom of the road, get on the bus, get off two hundred and fifty yards up at the shops, and do the reverse journey. I think we've got to counter that. Well, I think it might be easier for them to walk sometimes yes. at the time you have to wait. Yes. But also, you know, if you get in the bus journey of a few stops, if you get off a stop early and mm. do your, you know, just walk to the next stop, you've yep. probably done your 10 minutes. Yeah, you probably have. And really? I, that's great advice. Mm. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Doyle, how do you manage to keep yourself fit? What do you do? I walk a lot, actually. I've done yep. a walk in holiday and I walk from London Bridge over towards my place, which we're based in Blackfriars. Excellent. And that's 22 minutes a day. And it's just yeah. great. Thank I, you. I'm that's... sorry I didn't know it years ago. Yeah, yeah, well, and by the way, we're based just off Blackfriars. Yeah. So, you so guys should get together and start walking along together. Yeah, so this guy who claims he does it in 10 minutes thinks he's, you know, he's he's old speedo walker. Well, I have done it in 10 minutes. Rubbish. Rubbish. You can't do it. You do it down the side of the river. Rubbish. rubbish. And then rubbish. you don't have to stop for traffic. Yeah, rubbish. It's garbage. It's not rubbish. rubbish. Yeah, anyway, Doctor, thank Doctor, you I, very I, much. I apologise uh, for the rudeness of my broadcasting colleague here, Mr. Barry. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. Yes, Dr. Yvonne Doyle. Across the UK, on Online and on DAB. The two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Locker of Kalita Coco. Locker of Kalita Coco. That's one from the archives. Now, yes, I've got a great yes, uh, email here, uh, which yeah. came in a little bit earlier from right. Uh, Richard, right? Richard, yeah. uh, Who says, and it's rather a long email, I'm not going to read the whole thing out, right. uh, but it refers back to last week, yes. uh, which he describes as the madness yes. uh, when you took over the show. Mm. Uh, it says, within the first hour of the inaugural solo show, mm. uh, Porky forgot he was broadcasting professionally to the nation and regressed into one of those conversations he has with himself. Mm. Uh, he sang karaoke records, celebrated the 40th anniversary of Elvis's death mm. uh, by getting an expert on the line to tell us all about Pete Best leaving the Beatles. Yeah, uh, and then capped it all by advising seven-year-olds to go on an all-night bender in a caravan and get bladderated. No, I didn't. Is that right? No. What would I? What do I tell seven-year-olds? Well, I don't know why he would do that. I don't know what he's talking about there. Yeah, anyway, and the, the he expert, says, "Welcome back." The expert we got on was Ray Connolly, right? Who, oh, yeah. who is an expert on the Beatles, he is. but who also met Elvis, right? And those two anniversaries coincided. Elvis died I'm on glad the same I missed day. Out on that. Yeah, as uh, Pete Best, uh, yeah. same date, I should say, as Pete Best was booted out of the Beatles. Okay. So we were able to ask Ray about both. And, did you get a lot of calls on Elvis and the Beatles? Oh, you? loads, really? loads. Yeah, people really wanted to know about uh, you know the the historical mm. genre of. Uh, uh, Hysterical, of, more like. Uh, of, uh, of rock's greatest. Uh-huh. Yeah, absolutely. Well, don't you want to ask me a few more questions about my holiday? Why? Well, why, well, why wouldn't you? It. Don't well, you want to ask me about my visit to Manchester? You know, well, I do is, want to ask you about that. Absolutely... You've already moaned about the yeah. trams. You've yeah. moaned about the traffic. Yeah. You've moaned about the fact that uh, you don't put pictures out of you and your celebrity friends, yeah. even though you did put pictures uh, out of you and your celebrity I friends. I stayed at the... In Hilton fact, with... one of the pictures that I saw you put out yes. uh, was of you saying uh, that Brian Kidd was waving at you. That's right. When he clearly wasn't waving at you. In fact, he was looking in a completely opposite direction. He'd just finished waving at me. How did you get down on the pitch, anyway? Uh, 
Well, because I was a guest of a betting company oh, who right. uh, who actually have a very big interest in Manchester City. Is that right? And they particularly like me at the moment because uh, when I make predictions for them, yeah. they're starting to come true at an alarming well, rate. Cost of a load of money, though. Uh, they could find themselves in liquidity problems if they uh, if they. Well, they may have to don't ban have you. To do about it. To ban you from uh, making predictions. But I also stayed at the Dorchester of the North, of course. Oh, what that place in uh, Chester you the, was raving the Grosvenor about. Hotel in Chester. Oh yeah, yes. you put out a picture yes. of some woman as well, didn't you? That you had a dinner with. Uh, that that was the that was the very lovely wife Sue yeah. of my uh, very good mate Johnny, and oh, yeah. uh, we went out for a splendid Sunday afternoon lunch in Chester, uh-huh. visited a few hostelries, and then, and then settled at an Italian right. uh, restaurant, which served, um, I have to say, excellent food. Really? So it was all for dinner. Very successful trip. What did I, you have? I had minestrone soup. Oh yeah. And and sang for the rest of the people in the restaurant. You Life sang. is a minestrone. You sang. Wah, 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 wah. You actually got up in the middle of a restaurant. And sang. Well, I gave him a few bars, you know, because I always do. I sort of break into song when I'm hit feeling a few good. Bars. And uh, uh, followed by spaghetti bolognese. Mm. But my special order of bolognese yeah. is not much spaghetti, right. but loads of bolognese. Right. So I so, like the meat better than the, the yeah. pasta. Well, surely normally they would give you a decent mix of both. Well, no, I, I've been into some Italian restaurants where they just kind of serve it from the pan. Mm. And it's, it's actually spaghetti just with spaghetti sauce yes. around it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Clinging onto it. Right. I don't like that. I don't. I don't like the spaghetti to be coated in bolognese sauce. Mm. I like the spaghetti to form a base, as oh, though yeah. it was rice, uh-huh. and then pile on an enormous amount of bolognese yeah. on the top. That doesn't sound very good for somebody with a third of a heart working. Well, well because it's uh, the meat uh, content to me is more important than the pasties. Yeah. See. No, I know. But you've got to mm. be careful. Why? Because uh, when there's, you eat... well, there's no there's no bad things in in freshly ground beef. Well, no, there isn't. But no. there are problems uh, if you eat too much red meat in terms of your heart. It's because... not red by the time it's cooked. Well, it's still red meat, though. Yeah, well, it, it red was meat. red meat, but it's not red. It's well, brown. Well, don't call it brown meat. Well, no, it is, because it's cooked <laughs> up, and it, uh, it doesn't give me a problem. Well, let me tell you this, right? Yeah. We're talking about being fit and keeping mm. fit and all of that. Mm. Uh, my older son, uh, for his birthday, his birthday was uh, taking place while we were there. Right. Got a Fitbit for his birthday, right? Yes. Uh, now, he measures his heartbeat on that. Right. Because that's what it does. A Fitbit? A Fitbit, yeah. It's like a, you wear it on your wrist. It's like a watch. Oh, I thought it was one of those uh, spinning things. What was that called? That eh? was a Fitbit, wasn't it? No. The spinning thing? The spinning thing. Yeah. Yeah, that no, woman spinners. invented the hey? spinners. You mean? Oh, is that called a spinner? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go on. Fidget spinner. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Fidget yeah. spinner. Okay. Go on. Yeah. Mm. No, this is a Fitbit. This is something that you wear on your wrist. And right. It measures your heartbeat. Right. It measures how far you've walked. Yes. It sets targets for you to yes. keep yourself fit and all that. Yes. He noticed that as as he was eating, mm. his heart rate was increasing. So yeah. the more you eat, the more your heart rate increases. Well, of course, it does. You, you idiot. Know that. You know. Well, be- what would you call him an idiot for? Well, because there are the two main uh, functions of your heart yeah. are one to pump blood around your right. body. And yours doesn't do that, right? And s- no, it doesn't. And is second, it true? And so when they try and take blood from your yeah. finger, nothing comes out. It's it's a you're problem. You're literally like a vampire. It's a problem. It's a problem so because my your I blood have, le- your blood pressure is so low. I have le- I have low blood blood pressure, which may, means two things. One, that they whenever I, I get like you know uh, punctured, so to speak, punctured. to take blood. Yeah, because right. that's what they do. Pricked. Uh, yes, Surely. that's that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we call it in the profession punctured. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they, and, and they, uh, I've never heard of that. And they they draw the blood off. They have to go quite deep to find a, a, a suitable vein. Really? But the second thing is that, uh, and I've seen this happen to yeah. other heart patients, they foolishly sort of bend down to tie their shoelaces. Yeah. And because their blood pressure is so low, mm. they immediately fall forward and smash their head on the floor because right. they go dizzy. Oh, right. You're not supposed to do that. Well, you because see. when you put your head sort of below yeah. your the, waist yes, level. Yes, that's or right. Like that's that. absolutely right. So that's, that's low a, blood pressure. That's low blood pressure right. because the heart hasn't got the, the uh, strength to pump the blood yeah. uh, up and I down. I saw a so tweet, one of those tweet mm. jokes from somebody the other day mm. who said, mm. you know, I used to take uh, drugs and drink a lot. Yeah. Which is now I just stand up to it very quickly. It has the same effect. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, it could be, and uh, there was a, there was a. <laughs> there was a joke at the Edinburgh Festival because they tried to find the best jokes. Last oh yeah, they always week. do that, don't they? Yeah, and they were all mostly pretty. They pathetic. are pretty lame, pretty pathetic. But I, but I saw one saying something like, "Tofu is my new drug." My old drug was drugs, <laughs> which I thought was quite good, actually. That's not bad, yeah. yeah. Uh, here's one from uh, Bryn. He says, great subject. I love walking. I walk to the local shop, a brisk walk to the local beach, 20 minutes away, uh, and in the evenings I take the dog out. Mm. I thought it was going to be a joke about you walking. You know, when, yeah, when so somebody right, yeah. says, you know, I walk 10 miles a yeah, day. You go, yeah. why don't you keep walking? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And by yeah. tomorrow you could be halfway to John O'Groats. I, 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 I totally agree. Yeah. But uh, when you were asking me about, uh, you asked me something else about the, the uh, well, Italian restaurant, didn't you? 
uh, well, I asked you what you ate. I was going to yeah. ask if you had Parmesan cheese in addition. Yes, I did. So it yeah. uh, wasn't a very healthy meal, was yeah. it? Well, you yeah, know, that was I the minestrone. It. Life is a minestrone. Yeah. Did, you give them a, did you give them a, a musical accompaniment to the main course as well? Well, I just, I just said that, and I pointed to it. I said, dressed up in Parmesan cheese, uh-huh. as the bloke was spooning it onto my uh, spag bol. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, Ali says, the Italian way is lots of pasta with a small coating of sauce. Exactly. When in Chester, Porky. Yeah, no, but I said I don't like that, so I have to reverse it. I always ask for an extra dish of the bolognese really? by my plate. Right. Yes, that's right. Well, I'm very happy On to... On the side, uh, so to speak. You so, know that's, what I mean? so that's your big week away, right? Big well, plate of spaghetti bolognese in <laughs> Chester. Yeah. Tremendous. Well, I'll tell you about some of the octopus I had when I was in Greece. Ooh, right? golly, I'm not sure I want to hear about that. Mm. Might put me off my... Um, after show drink, <laughs> if we're going to have one. Well, we, I'm sure we will. Uh, yeah. We've got lots to talk about. Uh, mm. Of course, coming up, uh, we're going to be talking about billionaires and why there's so many more of them in That's this right. country. Mm. Uh, this is Talk Radio. The 21st century dream team of dialogue, debate and discourse. The two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Radio. We are the two mics coming up a little bit later on. It's Ask Porky. So if you've got a problem, if you've got a, a situation that you need an answer to, uh, that you've never been able to get an answer to, now's the time to put in the question. Uh, you tweet us at the two mics or, of course, look for us on our Facebook yep. page as well. Yep. Uh, we're going to talk in a moment to James Montague, who's written a fascinating book called The Billionaire's Club, The Unstoppable has. Rise of Football Super Rich Owners. Yep. Let me just read you a couple of quick tweets, though. Uh, Jim says this, Porky forgot to mention his low blood pressure may result in reduced blood flow to the brain. Mm. That would explain <laughs> yeah. a lot. Well, yeah. You know, that's a bit harsh, yeah. isn't it? But uh, uh, you could say that. Ernie says, I'm not surprised Mike Perry likes spaghetti bolognese mm. sauce as he talks a lot of bolognese uh, or something <laughs> like that. That's very harsh. And Patrick indeed. says, Porky saying his heart doesn't do its job just confirms my suspicion mm. that he doesn't actually have one. Yeah, well, you see, uh, all these wild and mad theories make it uh, even more impressive that I've got through life mm. with uh, one third of my heart indeed. working where most people would have uh, keeled over by now. They would. Yeah. Now, we'll get back to Chester and we'll get back yep. to Rhodes as well and my trip there last uh, in the last seven days. Yes. But let's talk to James Montague, who, as I say, has written a fascinating yeah. book about the super rich owners of football clubs mm-hmm. in this country, which is a relatively uh, sort of new phenomenon. Yep. James, a very good morning to you. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Not yep. at all. Hi, James. Good uh, to hear from you. I mean, you. anything uh, that starts with the title The Billionaires Club is, is always going to be a fascinating kind of uh, uh, journey, isn't mm-hmm. it? What made you decide to write this book? Well, it came about when I was... Um, it's actually when I wrote my first book, which was a, it was a very obscure uh, book about football in the Middle East, mm. which I, th- I thought was quite obscure at the time. Uh, and it came out in August 2008. And when it came out, it came out just as Sheikh Mansour bought Manchester City. Right. Mm. And um, I remember I was in the UK at the time, and I'd, I'd been living in the United Arab Emirates, and I'd known a little bit about um, how the power structure worked there, how the economics worked there. Some of the less favourable things, like the human rights abuses, the fact that there's a huge um, kind of underclass of essentially indentured slaves who could have built the country. Mm. And everybody was asking, who is Sheikh Mansour? Why is he buying Manchester City? Uh, what, whose money is he using? Where's it come from? And it was a lot of those answers that I, I actually could have had, but nobody really wanted to listen to it because mm. the, the narrative was that this was a, a, like a distant, bored, rich guy that just wanted to get involved in football because he loved it. Uh, the money was his own private wealth, and, and most of that wasn't right. It clearly wasn't right because he's one of the most powerful guys, one of the most powerful men in the UAE royal family. So from that point, I started thinking, well, you know, there's, the, you know, there's loads of these other rich guys. I mean, you think from 2003, Roman Abramovich coming in really changed the type of investment that was going into football clubs mm. from kind of millionaire, local, philanthropic owners, some of them good, a lot of them not very good, mm. Um, and so from there on, I've, I kind of kept the track on it. And then it's, it's really just exploded alongside, I guess, the explosion in the 1%, you know, mm. the, the increased number of billionaires. Uh, and this book tried to tell the story of, of kind of where they've come from, you know, what we don't know about them and where what their investment in the game will do to the game in the future. Yeah, no, I, t- I, I totally agree with all of that, James. And, and you're so right to uh, contrast the ownership now and the ownership then. For instance, when I was a kid growing up, the chairman of Manchester United was a bloke called Louis Edwards, Martin Edwards' father. He was a local a butcher. butcher. Right. Local yeah, butcher, ab- absolutely right. Do you remember the, the guy from Carlisle, Michael Somley, who tried to buy Manchester United for 10 million quid and very nearly did? 
he'd be sitting yeah. on a billion pounds now. So, so it's uh, it's all changed. The one thing I've never understood is why very rich men buy football clubs in this country because they know that all the money that comes in, the TV money, the gate money and all that, is going to be demanded by their manager to pay the top uh, fees for great players around the world who will then be paid the top wages. There won't be very much left over for the profit margin for the owner. Well, exactly. And this is what I wanted to get down down to, to the bottom to talk about because... You know, people talk about ego being a huge thing. And I think in, in the past, I think ego was a big... Yeah. Uh, I interviewed Saxon Sinawatra for this book. I tracked him down in Paris. Mm. And uh, anyone knows a little bit about sort of politics, he was, he was the prime minister of Thailand. He was deposed in a coup yep. at the same time that he was owning Manchester City. Mm. Uh, and he had that one kind of crazy season at City where he hired Sven-Goran Eriksson and got fired. And then he was deposed in a coup and now he's in exile. Yeah. Yeah, for him, you could tell it, was, it wasn't very much about exile. He was a populist politician and that's, that's what he knew. He knew how to excite large amounts of people with mm. big showpiece events and things. But what I found is there... You know, it's, the football business isn't a great business no. in terms of money. In the past, it hasn't been. It's slightly changing now. Yeah. The profit, the huge revenues, uh, very little profit. Um, so when somebody like Sheikh Mansour took over Manchester City, he said, oh, yeah, no, we see this as, as, as an entertainment product. We mm. see this as an entertainment uh, investment. Yeah. But, you know, this is a guy who made something like, I think it was three or four billion pounds bailing out or kind of helping to bail out Barclays Bank. Mm. He doesn't need the money. So what are the other reasons for that? Mm. And it's slightly simpler looking at the Middle East in particular, the UAE, of which he's a member of the UAE royal family, yeah. and also PSG, which is effectively owned by Qatar, they are owned by states. Mm. And so they're not in it for the football. And they're no. not in it for the money, because this is all a drop no, in the ocean. No, they're, they're, they're in it for what it does for them politically, what it does for them in the geopolitical yeah. structure of the world. Uh, Qatar, but, but, does it, but is it yeah. not just a vanity project? I mean, because what, what is, does yeah. it do, for example, if you are a mm. state like Qatar yeah. and you are kind but of... But you, you know, need the credibility for the World Cup yeah, coming up. and you might need yeah. the credibility for the World Cup. But, I mean, yeah. in terms... It, it seems to me that an awful lot... And I include Sheikh Mansour in this, that mm. you see them uh, at the games and it looks like they brought a whole sort of entourage of people with them yeah. to go, why don't you come to my box at Manchester City? Well, they own the club. Gonna, and it's going to be great. You know, it's more that to me than it's giving them access to, say, a seat at the high tables of Downing Street or something. But it's not... Well, I mean... Part of it is not just just football, by the way. I mean, this is something that's been going on really uh, in the past 15 years. Qatar and UAE investing heavily in kind of Western high-profile trophy assets. You think of Qatar with with Harrods, any number of big buildings. I mean, the Shard, for instance, you know, that's another one that's been built by Qatar. That's right. It's about it's about becoming so entrenched within kind of Western and British economy that it's almost impossible to to take you apart if there's Mm. any kind of geopolitical issues in the Middle East. Yeah. Of course, this is a neighbourhood that is very unstable at times. Mm. But the, the bigger issue is that when you, when you talk about a World Cup in 2022, when you talk about Manchester City and the Etihad Stadium, what you're not then talking about is what is kind of going on back home. The, 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 the reputation laundering, this phrase I kept on hearing from human rights groups mm. who, who couldn't believe that you know, Sheikh Mansour is a complete free pass, basically. When back home, he's part of the government. Mm. He's a very high-profile figure within the UAE government. This is a place that has zero democracy, that has this kafala system of migrant labour, which means that people live and are treated in, in horrific conditions. Mm. Um, and um, and also, it's almost, you know, virtually freedom of speech has been basically crushed there. You can, yeah. you can be put in jail for two years for even tweeting something that could be construed as... Mm. Any way critical of anything. Mm. So, you um, better not go there, then. No, You've been there, haven't you? So how did you manage to escape out of that place? Well, I kept my mouth shut and stayed in the Western bars. <laughs> Well, and that's and that's and that's it, isn't it? Because yeah. many people, and I lived. I mean, I lived in Dubai, uh, which is obviously a different emirate, but the same country. I yes. lived there for yes um, for two and a half years, mm. and and that's kind of you know when you're there, you live in this kind of bubble, which, which is a very Western bubble. Um, yep. you, you know, you only really meet other Westerners there. Maybe a few kind of um, mm. Indian managers in your company, but outside there's a there's a whole a bigger issue, and, sure. and football is playing a really important part in making people kind of forget. Sure. Now, no, 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 James, what I want to ask you is this. You all, we all remember the South Sea Bubble Company, OK? And the South Sea Bubble was when investment in the South Sea when reached... 
Uh, it was in the 18th century. I don't remember uh, it. And in, in, well, if you're a student of history like I am, you'd know all about no. it. And the, the investment reached such a peak, it burst. Now, is the, yeah. is the bubble in football going to burst? Because there is so many billions now invested in this industry. If anything went wrong with it, never mind about the people who call themselves footballers or, or managers or coaches, the, yeah. the actual industries that surround football in this country, people who make shirts, people who make uh, sporting equipment, people who provide transport, to and from clubs. It's a huge, huge industry with all sorts of industries dependent on it. Yeah, we could talk about any historic bubble. The tulip trade, for instance, yes. another famous uh, bubble that exploded. It you know? was. And I think that there, there, there are two schools of thought here. One is that this is a bubble that will burst because this is effectively driven by huge television revenues. Yes. So they've, you know, if you look at kind of the most, the richest football, uh, the richest sports league in the world, that's the NFL. Um, you know, that is largely driven by these huge television deals. Now, what's happened in the past kind of year, mm. and this is something that Sky have had as well, um, they've seen a drop-off in people uh, in their viewing figures. Mm. Um, they've had the same in, in America as well, which suggests that it could be technology playing a role. Cord cutters, people who aren't watching television anymore, maybe watching it online, maybe not even paying for it online, but watching it in different ways. Yeah. So there's one school of thought that says, you know, this stream of income, when it's cut off, will burst the bubble. The other, which is, I think, is why football is becoming a far more um, interesting investment opportunity, especially for Americans, because yeah. Americans have made their money, especially the American investors, if you look at the Glazers and Cronky, mm. yes. uh, Arsenal, all these characters, they've made their money in U.S. franchise sports systems, That's right. that, and, they, and they're bringing that into European soccer. They see mm. a really undervalued sport with a global yeah. spread that really American football can never have. Mm. So they see something, a, a bigger opportunity, which is to... Um, spread the game and spread yeah. their brand into yeah. new and developing markets like the US and China mm. and India. So one school of thought says, well, actually, if people really are cutting down, uh, cutting the cords, then yeah. the next TV deals won't be as big, or maybe the one after mm. will, will have a correct. Or, 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 or James, excuse or, me, interrupt, and there might not be yeah. a TV deal. There might be a Google deal, or they might be or, a or a Twitter deal, or, or, or a Twitter deal, or mm. something like exactly. that. Exactly. I mean, and this is it. This could be. I mean, Amazon have, are moving into this market. Uh, mm. I mean, Twitter don't really make any money, so I'm not yeah. sure how they'll do it. But I, I get, you know, I get the point. And yeah. but they, I mean, Twitter were doing were, were doing live NFL games last season. They were. Um, it, the, the problem is that Twitter doesn't. Yeah, it's it's it's, just, it's not really a very profitable company. Facebook no. is, and Facebook has Facebook mm. and, and Amazon mm. has clout in this market, and they're looking at the next round of deals mm. uh, and seeing whether they can uh, get themselves involved in that. And of course, you know, technology will overtake the need for a television. I mean, I, I mean, I still love watching football on the television, mm. but I mean, of course, it's, it, this is you know times change. So if that really does happen. Um, then it could that could lead to a correction, but I think the people that are investing it, especially from the US, but also from China, you know, they still see that there's a long way to go if this bubble's going to burst. There's still a huge growth in this in this mm. market, and you can see because of the popularity of the Premier League. I mean, in a you know, I've quite, I have quite a bit of pride when I travel abroad to these places, and I see, you know, that the people are wearing the West Ham shirts in kind of yep. in Xi'an in the centre of China. That's there right. Is, there, there is, you know, it's been an incredible. It has, story, it has, think, it's, about, it's, about it's about astonishing. British culture, the, yeah. The growth and is utterly astonishing, yeah. James, listen, we're going to leave James, it there. Thanks very we're, much we're indeed. Out of time, but thanks mm. very much. The book is called The Billionaires Club: The Unstoppable Rise of Football's Super Rich Owners yep. by James Montague. Mm. Uh, well worth a read. Uh, you can get it in all the normal places. Coming up in the next hour, we're going to talk to Robert Jobson uh, about Princess Diana's anniversary and when it's all going to stop. Plus, of course, ask Porky. This is Talk Radio. Mm. Across the UK, online and on DAB. It's a new frontier in broadcasting. The Two Mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Good morning, I'm Mike Graham. He's Mike Parry. We are The Two Mics. I'm back from holiday. Porky has been busy, busy, busy while I've been away. A lot of people saying that uh, uh, they're very glad that I'm back. Uh, they quite enjoyed him on his own, uh, but in fact, The Two Mics are obviously better. Scott says this, El Blanco singing every time parts of his Italian meal were served. Mm -hmm. I'm sure the other diners were mm -hmm. over the moon. Yeah, they would have been, yeah. I mean, you know, they, they don't often see me. 
Uh, no, they don't. That's probably why they're quite happy. Uh, here's one from Alex who says, Thank God MG's back to steer the ship. Maybe Porky could take his next long walk off a short pier. That's uh, rather provocative, isn't it? It is, yeah. isn't it? I'm not going to respond to that. Uh, Nat says, I'm surprised Porky managed to get through the end of last week without you and he still has a job. Mm. It's a bit harsh. Yeah, it is a bit harsh. Mm. You've got to no. remember that, yeah, I always I accept that two mics will always be better than one mic. However, if you want one of the two mics to be one mic, I suggest you back me because uh, old Lowface here has <laughs> never see, done it. doesn't take you long, does it? Mm. Uh, I've never done it. What mm. a load of old rubbish. Mm. Uh, here's one from uh, Donovan. He says, it's my 37th birthday today, fellas. Could it make my day, please, and have a shout-out uh, of you two radio greats? Uh, who's, what's the name of the chap? Uh, Donovan, 37. Donovan, 37. 37's yeah. a great age, mate. Good luck to you. You will have a great and fulfilling life if you follow the path that the Porkmeister followed. And then one from Rodney. Hi, Mike and Mike. Can you please give my wife, Rachel, a 30th birthday shout-out mm-hmm. today? We love the show. OK, Rachel, at 30 years of age, you're in your prime, my dear. You have a great and wonderful life, and just remember, bladderation in moderation on your birthday. Yeah, exactly right. Now, a man that we know very, very well, uh, and with whom we've worked very closely over the years, far mm. too many years to remember, I'm afraid, yeah, yeah. Uh, is the man, indeed, who is about to talk to us, Robert Jobson, uh, who likes a bit of bladderation in moderation, as far as I remember. He is, of course, the royal correspondent uh, for the royal editor, I should say, of the Evening Standard yep. here in London, uh, because the Princess Diana Memorial kind of um, um, pull-out industry, I suppose yes. you might say, is still very much it's going, yes. and it will be going until, I presume, the end of the month. Yeah. Robert, a very good morning to you. Welcome. Hi, guys. How are you? Very yeah, well. Hi, Rob. Very, very well, well indeed, indeed, mate. And my first question, I'm sorry to butt in like this, is when is it all going to end? <laughs> well, I think it's probably coming to an end, actually, Mike, because I think 20 years, um, there's been an awful lot of industry. I mean, I mean yeah, I've written a couple of books, I can't yeah. say I haven't about it, but yeah. the reality is, I think Diana's passed from being a almost a sort of political, iconic figure that we knew when she was just after she died to now a historical figure. And I can't really see that this can continue. I mean, yeah, there'll be mm. times when it's marked at 25 years, maybe. But I think that um, the here and now is probably what's more important. And William and Harry have done their bit with their yeah. documentaries, and I think they've said what they want to say, and I think that probably draws a line under it. Well, I wonder, yeah, because, I mean, we're looking today at the news and the GCSE results coming in and looking at these young people who are coming out of uh, school and going to be heading to university and all of that. Mm. I can't imagine that, that Princess Diana means very much to them. Well, you know, even if you're 25, you'd have been five years old when she yeah. died. So yeah. I can't imagine that, you know, but actually saying that, I mean, I, I, I did a book with Diana's bodyguard, Ken Wolf just after she died, and that mm. was a Big seller. We brought one out um, quite recently. Well, this this year, it's it's gone in at number five. So I don't really know. Mm. I, I, I mean, I think that she was an iconic figure. People want to know more and more about her, and she yeah. sort of was different to the other members of the royal family. Certainly, really. Well, she was like Eva Perron, really, wasn't she? I mean, the whole industry grew up around the myth that was Diana. Mm. Um, not mm. a lot of people sort of knew her personally. She was she was an image, uh, an iconic Im- image to most people. You, you don't meet princesses normally and, and that kind of thing. But I what astonished me, Rob, and of course you're still in the industry that Mike and I used to be in, the newspaper industry, this all started about a month ago when I see national newspapers bringing out the same supplements every Saturday mm. with just another update on the Diana years and all that. Is there the demand for that out there? Does you know, it, well, does it still sell papers? Yeah, yeah, television? exactly. Well, I think, you know, we, the August is always known, as you guys know, as the city season, and sure. I think that probably some of these documentaries... Went a little bit early, in my view. I was surprised that um, they did. And then you had the documentary with ITV, which was the first, actually, which the the, um, princes were involved in. Then there was the Channel 4 one, which I thought was a pretty good documentary, Mm -hmm. um, with the In Her Own Words. That's right. That had all gone very, very early. And then now you've got the BBC one. So, Mm. and we haven't even reached the 31st yet. And there's a Sky one as well, isn't there? Sky one's been done as well. Exactly. Yeah. So I think it was more to do with that and the fact that you've got talking heads that not talking before that gave the newspapers yeah. fresh impetus. I, I, yeah, one oh, great no, I mystery. Saw, sorry, I was going to say, I saw yeah. a headline in the Daily mm. Mirror, though, uh, which was revealing, supposedly for the first time, I presume, which is why they made it the splash, mm. that, uh, you know, that the driver's car had, in fact, been uh, been involved in an accident before. And it's like, well, we knew all that at the time. Why are they kind of yeah, well, retreading it? it all? <laughs> you mm. knew it, Mike. I mean, yeah. I read every single headline that... Mm. Uh, that uh, has appeared this 
Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this summer I'd already known before, but <laughs> yeah. I, I'm sure that most of the royal correspondents who were writing them didn't even know that because, you know, cuts are hard to check, aren't they, these yeah, days? They but said... look, look, I just think that most of the stories have mm. been run before. How come they not have been run before? Yeah, well, absolutely right. Now, the great mystery here, of course, Rob, is that I was the man who actually revealed to the world that Dana was dead. <laughs> I took hell of a risk when I was the executive editor of the Press Association mm. and put it out 17 so minutes. So you keep claiming, but in it's... all of the... In all yeah. of the... Oh, I thought it, yeah, but wasn't that you... you, didn't you, you took a risk because didn't Robin Cook tell someone out in Indonesia? Yeah, or he did. He, we had a, we had was, a... That was a bold, you know. But once the foreign section had been told, I think it was a bold decision to take, but a good decision because it was right. So well, it was right. Charlie Miller was the defence correspondent with Robin Cook out in Malaysia, and do you know what I did as well? This is like a bit of newspaper folklore. I decided not to ring up the editor and get him out of bed, the editor of the PA, because well, I know he would have said don't do it. He, I know he would have said don't do it, Rob. Do you know why? Well, he cause... always would have done two sources on it. On well, report, well, but... he was very establishment orientated. I think he had visions of getting a knighthood one day for being the editor of the PA for 10 yeah. years or something like that, you know. And I think mm. he felt that I did. So I deliberately didn't ring him. Then I put it out and then everybody sort of said, your career's over. Nobody's standing this up. And then 17 minutes later, you know, Mr. Chevonnement, the, uh, the uh, French well. foreign secretary, came out of the Versailles Palace and confirmed it. And yeah, but at in that all stage... The, in, all, in all of mm. the... Uh, sort of, decision, I think. Mean, well, yeah. well, you say that, Rob, but I mean, in all of the recountings of history that I've read... Yeah. Yes. And that many people who follow this show have read. Mm-hmm. At no point is Mike Parry mentioned. Now we well, all know. It's wrong. Well, it's we, wrong, he, he, he may well have be been. Made, we should make more of this. Exactly. Well, exactly. well my, my my preferred position on it mm. is that perhaps he wasn't actually in that night uh, because he was <laughs> the uh, supposed uh, uh, you know editor of the news organisation. Mm. That he's going to claim it when in fact it wasn't his decision. Oh, at no, all. it was his decision. Yeah. I'm sure it was because I remember the story at the time. Of yeah. being, it came out of Indonesia or wherever it was that yeah. Robin Cook was. Right. I remember that. That's how it broke. But the strange thing was. Um, you know, with all of these these things, I remember when the Queen Mother died. I yeah. I was working with the CNN at the time, and I had one source on it, which was bang on, and they right. wouldn't run it. They just wouldn't run it without two sources. So well, do you know the strangest thing was, Rob? Nobody else would run it. And in fact, I remember watching the reaction to Sky, who would obviously have had um, you know some sort of machine there, which which always flashed up. PA yeah. news flashes, mm. and they stopped talking when they saw it. Yeah. Uh, it was, you know, because it was that much of a shock, and, and they wouldn't run well, it. Well, PA was, of course, the, yeah. the organisation of record, wasn't it? Well, they'd never got anything else wrong no. in the whole of the history right. of the world. You could have, you could have massively blown the whole gaff oh, for oh, them. Oh, yeah, I could have. There's no way the foreign <laughs> secretary... I mean, obviously, the, the, um, mm. the British ambassador in Paris had told the foreign secretary mm. that she was dead. I mean, yeah. that, that must have been the order of things, but, you know, just because Buckingham, Buckingham Palace liked to Announce things. I mean, when I, I did a story recently yeah. um, uh, for the Man on Sunday, I think it was, which where I wrote that the, the head, the head aide to the Queen was going to leave. Well, the palace would say, "Oh, we're not going to comment on this." And the next day, they announced it was leaving. Yeah, so, exactly. You know, they, they just yeah. like to be the ones that do the announcements, but sure, doesn't yeah. work like that. Sure. They're not much. They're not. I mean, they're a little bit more professional, I suppose, now than they were back in yeah. the days when uh, Diana was ratting their cage, but but not a lot. Let me ask you, Rob, about the future as well, because I've seen a few stories in the last week or two about, uh, you know, the succession to the throne and, and if mm. Prince, Prince Charles is going to get it, whether they're going to buy it. Well, the Sunday Times got it totally wrong, I can tell you that. It's okay. absolute mm. nonsense, because mm. the reality is there wouldn't be a Regency Act, the 1937 Regency Act, if if there wasn't a need for it. The fact is we've only had, ever had a Regency when King George III went mad, and I'm, I'm not saying that the Queen is going to go mad, but she's 91, and there is a suggestion, of course, at 95, that she will pass that... Uh, the Regency, if she's still alive, to Prince Charles. Well, there's nothing unusual in that, or, or wrong in that, because we're in uncharted territory here. Mm. We're in a time when we have the oldest monarch ever, the longest reigning monarch ever. How does she know what she's going to be like at 95, or even tomorrow? So the truth of it is, what's important here is the institution of monarchy, that it looks right, it feels right, and that there's a the stewardship of the monarchy is, is mm. seamless, and mm. I think that's what's crucial. Sunny Times just, you know, yeah. wrote a load of old nonsense. But, but um, I know that, uh, you know, in the ins and outs of succession and what is possible mm. and what the Queen has vowed to do, maybe what Prince Charles has vowed to do, but wouldn't it be a tremendous boost for the monarchy if we did leap a generation and William became so. the next king? I mean, wouldn't that turn us from the monarchy from being an old, stuffy establishment into a modern, young, vibrant organisation? Mm. I don't think so. I think that if we want to, this is an unelected institution that, you know, effectively has to survive because of the popularity and support of, general, of the general public that pays yeah. for it. So yeah. if we start having an X Factor monarchy, we can all stand for 
head of state herself. No, good the reality point. is you start, if you start doing it that way. In my view, the Prince of Wales has done a sterling job. He's yeah. the longest, longest serving heir to the throne. He knows no better than anybody how to do the job. I think he's, he's put in 50 odd years of service. Yeah. I've covered the trips with him and he, yeah. you know, he does a very good I think it would be a mistake to start chopping and changing and deciding which way you're going to do it. If you're going to do that, just forget about all the, um, mm. the succession laws. Just go straight in with a, an election. No, so you've convinced that's me. That's my view. Uh, yeah. but, uh, but will William still want to be king when it comes to round to being his turn? I'm sure he will. Do you? Well, it's not a question of whether you want to be, is it, really? You've yeah. got to be. So, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's his job. <laughs> yeah, that's true. It's like, it's like yeah, when I heard but... that the Pope had stepped down. I didn't know <laughs> popes could well, retire, actually. Well, yeah. that, that is exactly the point, you know, that what's happening here about regency and whether Prince Charles could be Prince Regent. Yeah. It's because but we've, had a, we've had a Pope abdicate. The, yeah. Queen will ne- the Queen will never abdicate. She no. doesn't have to. That's why we have a regency act. Mm-hmm. Now, the other question, I suppose, is on the day itself of the, of the anniversary of Diana's death, a lot of speculation was, was going around about what uh, Charles and Camilla would be doing because supposedly, and I don't know whether you can uh, back this up, a lot of newspapers have said that his kind of uh, kudos, if you like, his currency has fallen severely because of the way that uh, it appears that Mm. she was treated by him and and Camilla. I mean, uh, he's going to be doing something at Kensington Palace, right? Yeah, probably not cartwheels, I should think, but the reality (laughs) is... I mean, you know, it has been a bad stint for Charles. You know, there's no doubt about it. His popularity is pretty good until mm. these series of documentaries. But, you know, the, the public are fickle, polls are fickle. And uh, I should imagine that we'll, he'll be back on track within six months, eight months. Um, it's inevitable that that's the case. I mean, you know, if I listened to my mother, then she'd say Camilla should never be queen. But you've got to remember that, that the queen, she's never going to be queen like Queen Regnant, like Elizabeth or Victoria mm. or... Elizabeth the first. She's only, we're talking about Queen Consul because she's married to a future king. So mm, you know, mm, there we are. Mm. Yeah, I think she's had a lot of bad press actually over the last sort of two. Uh, over th- the top, yeah. Over yeah, the yeah, top, and, and for the last two or three weeks in particular, I think the anti-royalists have said, well, you know, because the memory of Diana has been revived, you know, after two decades. Mm. Uh, Camilla goes down. But I think Camilla, you said Charles has done a good job. I think Camilla's done a pretty good job. She has, very good. She stayed in the background. She's never, you know, t- take the analogy of. Work, uh, yeah. yeah, take the analogy of Heather Mills married to Paul McCartney after Sir Paul McCartney's wife died, Linda, you know, who's devoted to. And she tried to take the role of, of, mm. of Linda, you know what I mean? Well, Camilla's never done that, has she? Well, I think Camilla's got her own interest and her own work with, mm. you know, osteoporosis, other charities. But yeah. look, she plays a supporting role. She knows that the Prince of Wales. Is the main man. He's going to be the king or Prince Regent before that, and yeah. she knows that she's going to support him. Mm. He, I, I've been on these trips all around the world where he's batting for mm. Great Britain PLC, promoting us in these difficult times, yeah. and she plays a supporting role. And, he's, and he looks a much happier uh, yeah. um, person in doing his job. Sure, sure. great stuff, Rob. Please, and thank you very much indeed. Yes. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Robert Jobson, there, the royal editor of the London Evening Standard, author as well of several books. Absolutely, I'm um, very successful at uh, at doing it. Yeah, very good source on I all mean, things to do with the royal family. Thank you. Mike, it's it's fair to say, isn't it, that Charles didn't want, really want to marry Diana and uh, he was forced into marrying a very young girl, I 19 suppose. years of age, mm. because the royal court just decided it was time yeah. that he should get married. And when you look back at that time, it was mm. a very different time for this country of course it was. and for the society in which yeah. we now live. Yeah. And she really didn't have any clue about what was going to come her way, what she was, she no was, matter how many no. times people told her. I, t- I, I don't totally think she had agree. any idea. And then when William eventually married Kate, there was, you know, the idea then, you've got to research this woman's background to find out who right. all her relationships have been with throughout the whole of her life. There was nothing like that then. No. Because the world had changed. Exactly. It's just a pity Diana at such a tender age mm. got caught into royal protocol, yeah. which really, you know, was so excuse me, so choking and yeah. so suffocating to it mm. that it's no wonder it went it's wrong. More, it's more of a history lesson yeah. now, as I was saying, and yeah. hopefully by the time the end of August comes around, mm. uh, it will be very much put in a box and, yeah. and forgotten about. But we shall see. Yeah. Uh, we are the two mics. This is Talk Radio. We've got loads more coming up. The 21st Century Dream Team of Dialogue, Debate and Discourse. The two mics on Talk, Talk Radio. Radio. We'll get you talking. i
John Holmes is back on Talk Radio from One. On today's show, he's going to be helping you get your head around the new GCSE uh, marking system, which uh, is a complete nightmare, apparently. Is it? Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. yeah. You, how do you know this? Well, because my children, children have been affected by it, okay. and uh, oh. their school has actually put out a, uh, a, an advisory really? saying that we won't be able to know whether these, these GCSE results yeah. are any really good right. because we don't know how to measure them. Well, I'm sure John will get to the bottom of that. And also, of course, why middle-aged, uh, the middle-aged uh, group of them, yeah. us. Them, them, us. And us. Why yourself. are they not exercising enough? Yeah. So stay tuned and find out because yeah. uh, John will have the answers to both those remarkable situations. Does he not know we've already done all this? Sorry? Does he not know we've already done all well, this? Well, I mean, he'll have a different take on it, you see. You're, really? you're not very, uh, you know, not, not very understanding about these things. I think he needs to come up with some new ideas. Uh, the afternoon show with John Holmes from One, only here on Talk <laughs> Radio, but MG says it's not worth listening to. But I say That's it is. That's not what I said. I say it is. No, I say he needs to come up with some new ideas. So don't go anywhere at 1pm at, yeah. uh, because John is going to bring a completely That's different right. slant onto all these great stories. I hope okay? he's on time this time. We've laid the foundations. John will build on them. Yeah, he will. Yes. Absolutely right. Now, have you ever heard of a real-life mermaid? Uh, there is, uh, it does not exist. It does? No such thing. No, it does. I can no, tell you why, because we're going to talk to Grace Page, yeah. who is a real-life mermaid. She's a former Miss Mermaid UK, right. and she's owner of a company called oh, yeah. Hire a Mermaid. Mm-hmm. So if you thought mermaids weren't real, she's about to prove you wrong. Grace, mm. a very good morning to you. Hi, uh, good morning. Thank you yeah, very good much morning, for joining Grace. us. Now, uh, I've had a look at your website, which is, uh, of course, uh, the place where you would go to hire a mermaid. This is fascinating that people are, are, are interested in doing this. How did this all start for you? Um, pretty much the same as most mermaids, I'd say. I, I wanted to be a mermaid as a kid, and then I kind of grew up and uh, realised I could make a business from it. I was being a princess for children's parties and mm. I did some research and it was a big thing in America many years ago um, when I was looking, but there wasn't anything here at the time. Mm. Um, but obviously it's absolutely exploded now. Um, Has it? Yeah, yeah. See, I haven't seen a mermaid well, anywhere. Well, hang on. Can I just say this, Grace? Because I think it looks wonderful. It's very glamorous and uh, you look terrific and everybody will, you know, go ooh and ah and all that kind of stuff when they see you. But just a couple of things. Does it not mean that then turning from princess into mermaid, when you're a princess, all you need is like a hall or somebody's home to go into. Now you need somebody yeah. at the swimming pool, don't you? Pretty much, yeah. But um, I do children's parties in... You can hire your local leisure pool for children's parties. Oh, I see, right. A lot of the ones I do are there. Mm-hmm. You don't have to have your own pool. <laughs> right, OK, that's great. And then just to define mermaid, I mean, obviously, you're not physically a mermaid, but you put on this <laughs> terrific co- costume. You put on this terrific costume, which makes you look like a mermaid, like right. Daryl Hannah mm-hmm. in the famous film. And, yeah. and then, is there a, 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 a second issue here? And that is that wearing this costume and swimming in it is incredibly good for... For the body and developing muscles and toning and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's um, the type of swimming it's called. It's called the dolphin kick, and it's really good for your core because mm. so, all of it, all of the power comes from your core. That's one mistake a lot of people make. They think it's in the legs, but it's actually all kind of in your upper body and your core right. is where the dolphin kick kind of comes from. Right. That's and uh, did it take a long time to learn that? Because it's a, it's not a natural sort of human manoeuvre, is it? No, I mean, some, some people find the move come quite naturally to them, but for most people, it is quite a difficult thing to master. I think Porky and I um, would struggle with it, to be honest. Definitely. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that's, why I, that's why I always suggest if it's, if it's something that you want to do, if you want to swim in a mermaid tail or a monofin and do the dolphin kick, just get proper instruction first. Yeah, but the point is there aren't any male mermaids anyway, are there? Well, you can't have a male mermaid. No, of course you well, can't. Well, yeah, and the mermen. 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 There are male yeah. mermen, are there? Yeah, OK. There are. OK. Yeah. Now, well, they were in Stingray, weren't they? Of them well, no, no, that was Marina. Marina, Marina Aquamarina. Aquamarina. Yeah. Yeah. But were you... Uh, bizarrely, in... I know the next line to that. Uh, what Why can't it? you say that you'll always stay close to my heart? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's amazing. You won't remember Stingray, will you, Grace? <laughs> I do not. No, no exactly. Well, that was a, like a puppet show alongside Thunderbirds many, many years ago. But um, did you as a child see uh, Daryl Hannah in uh, the Mermaid film? I did, yes. I watched The Little Mermaid. I watched Splash. Right. Um, everything Mermaid that I could get my hands on. And by the way, talking about The Little Mermaid, I went to Copenhagen once, OK, no. in Denmark, mm. and I was so upset because I said, where's The Little Mermaid? Yeah. They said, we're not showing it to you. I said, why not? They said somebody sawed her head off. Somebody did do that. Yeah, yeah I remember that. Yeah, which Weird. was. Yeah, she was fixed and then she was vandalised. That's with horrible, isn't it? As well, it's ab- been fixed. Ab- absolutely yeah. awful. And I've just got one sort of slightly, mm. I suppose, um, uh, uh, administrative, administrative question. I mean, when you're um, obviously in the pool, you could be a mermaid and that's fine, but when you put the costume on, 
Um, how do you get from, say, the changing rooms into the pool? Do you have to, like, crawl there? You put it on oh, the edge of the pool. It's you not glamorous at all. It's not glamorous at all. I will try and, um, <laughs> normally I'll try and put it on poolside if I yeah. can. Obviously, if none of the children are going to see me. But if they are, right. then I'll normally have to, like, lay on the floor of a disabled toilet to wriggle it on. Um, yeah. And then they'll wheel mm. me through on a on a wheelchair and kind of just chuck me in the pool from there. That's fantastic, that sounds, honestly. sounds a bit cruel. No, it, it, it sounds fantastic. It sounds now, fantastic at all. How, it does, because it's very glamorous to be thrown into the oh. pool wearing a mermaid uh, outfit. Well, not if you've been wriggling around on the swimmer. floor of the toilet. Um, no, 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 don't be silly. I mean, no, the thing is, how fast is this growing, uh, Grace? Because obviously over the years, children have, you know, they've been to clowns parties and then they go to parties yeah. where they sort of uh, paintball each other and all this kind of stuff. Is this the new coming thing? Is this a new in thing? It, it really is, yeah. It, it's really exploded off over the last couple of years. It's kind of been slowly growing, and then over the last year, it's suddenly become the big thing, and all the children want mermaid tails, and parents want to get mermaid tails yeah. for their children, and yeah. I'm having people come to me like, how do I be a professional mermaid, um, and all that sort of thing. But what so do the little it, boys do at these parties? What do they do? Uh, a lot of the time, they'll either pretend to be mermaids or mermen, because obviously boys can want to be that too. Right. Or they um, they class themselves as sharks. Oh, sharks, so, uh, I see. They quite enjoy, yeah. Yeah, I see. that When they eat the mermaids, though. Uh, well, they don't do they in real life, you oaf. That's just Why? children playing, isn't it, you fool? Right. Um, <laughs> and and, and can I just add as well, you are a former Miss Mermaid UK, Grace, right? Yes. So Yeah, I won last year. You won last year. And is that like the equivalent of an old beauty pageant? Yes, it is, but it's it's kind of got a mermaid twist. So yeah. it, is, it is the beauty pageant, but it's not not so much focused on the outer beauty side. It's a lot of um, about marine conservation, yeah. uh, raising awareness and funds for the various charities. This year, the sponsored charity was the Marine Conservation Society, which is a charity in, here in the UK. Mm-hmm. And um, any anyone can enter. So you, there's not a there's not a specific like dress size you have to be yeah. to enter or anything like that. So it's yeah. a bit more of an inclusive pageant because I was put in charge of it this year. Oh, okay. it and as far as you know, you're saying it's really taken off in the children's parties kind of way. You're mm. a singer as well as, as a model yeah. and, and, a, and, a, and a mermaid. So I mean, are, are you finding that you're busier now as a mermaid than you say would be doing anything else? Yes, it's pretty much it's pretty much all I do now. I've um, I I barely ever do the princess parties anymore, right. not because I don't want to, but just because all my time is taken up mm. mermaiding. Mm. Um, just because obviously you've got to. Uh, there, there are quite there are a few professional mermaids growing at the moment. Right. There are the people there, but obviously you've got to find the ones that have the qualifications to actually right. be doing what they're doing. And have you got so more I'm quite than? Busy. Is it more than? Do you have more than one tail? I mean, does it does it vary yeah. for, depending on what you're doing? Yeah, I've got plenty of spandex tails and then one silicone tail. Okay, and do amazing. And oh, is there such a thing as a mermaid race? I mean, you say Why do you, you want to race them. Well, because it's you all were, about you, gambling with you. Isn't no, it? hang on, hang on. You were Miss Mermaid, surely. If there's a if there's six mermaids, can't you all be put into the pool like an Olympic? It's not the Olympics. Pool? Well, well, no, but I mean, are there mermaid races, Grace? Uh, there are competitions. I mean, if you win Miss Mermaid UK and you go you go to Miss Mermaid International, which yeah. is held in Egypt, and one of the categories that you get judged on is how distance swimming, how far you can swim in the mermaid tail underwater on one breath. Wow, so, I, that's, I guess brilliant. Yeah, yeah and that's, how far that's can you how far can you swim underwater with a mermaid's tail? Uh, me, my personal best at the moment is 75 metres. That's brilliant. 75 metres? That's astonishing. That, is that without breathing? Yes. Well, of course wow, it is. Wow, that's astonishing. You can't that breathe is. underwater unless you're a real mermaid. I didn't know you were allowed to wear a snorkel or something. <laughs> no. No, no. <laughs> no. Okay. Yeah, yeah well, 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 listen, good luck with it, Grace. Thank you very Indeed, much. Grace. Tell Thank us, you very uh, much. Tell us where they can find your website if anyone wants to hire you for a, a mermaid party. Yeah, if you go... Oh, that's a bit unfortunate. The info on there, Miss Mermaid UK info is on there as well, as well as the Mermaid Camp, which is how you can learn to be a mermaid. So there you go. you've got to repeat that because I'm afraid you blanked out. Honestly, just you gave us the address. Go on. Oh, I'm sorry. It's hireamermaid.uk. Okay, thank you okay, very much indeed. Thank you very much, Grace Page, who's Probably. a mermaid. Yeah. I think you should go and learn to be a merman. I think it'd be great. I don't think so. That'd be a great video wouldn't to Wouldn't do out. anything for me. No, it wouldn't do anything no. for me either, but I just find it very amusing. I'm not a wiggler. Across the UK, online and on DAB. The two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Is this 
of a mermaid type song. No, it's not actually, but it does sound like sounds that. Like it? It sounds like a mermaid. Yeah, it sounds thing. a bit like King Neptune. Yeah. You know, playing you a tune from underneath the waves it and does, all that yeah. kind of stuff. But under the sea. Yeah, under the sea. That's yeah. right. You know, maybe from the lost city of Atlantis. Yes. But it has fact, got that sort of feel. It to has. It. it has. But in fact, that is, um, believe it or not, the thing music to the one of those famous bits of broadcasting that happened in this country on a daily uh, basis, okay. and that is well, the shipping you know, forecast. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. I thought you were going to say one of the most famous bits of broadcasting, like one of the ones you did last week. Yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> well, that is very famous now. It's legendary stuff. It is. But can you believe that it's mm. 150 years ago today that the first shipping really? forecast went out? Well, on the on the wireless. On the wireless, yeah. My goodness yeah. me. Every six hours, a weather forecaster at the Met Office sits down to write a very pre- uh, precise script. It's called the shipping forecast. Yeah. Reams of meteorological data must be compressed into just 350 words yeah. because that's all there is time to read in the nine minutes of live radio allotted to it. Yes. Nine minutes in the 24 hours. A lot hours of people cycle. love listening to it even though they yeah. don't really care what's actually being said because right. it has a kind of mellifluous nature to it, it, does. doesn't it? It does, I mean, yeah. I remember listening to it as a kid because yeah. we always had the home service on Radio 4 yeah. as it later became. That's right. And um, I became sort of fascinated mm. by the places that they mm. mentioned. Yes. Like Fastnet yes. and Lundy. That's and in right. Fact, one of my famous kind of, one of my... Happiest moments mm. was when I took my daughter to Lundy Island. Yes. Because it's the only place on the shipping forecast I've actually been. Uh, yeah. Which is out in the middle of the, um, the sort of off the Bristol, coast of Devon. Isn't it well, it's the off the coast Channel. of Devon. Well, it's a little bit further out. Is it? Yeah. It's okay, off the yeah. coast of sort of north yeah. Somerset, sort yeah. of north, northwest Devon, that kind yes, of area. Yes, okay. And well, it's amazing. So it, in fact, I was there um, when we were having a quite a hot summer mm. uh, and we were staying in a, in a cottage somewhere down in the Devon countryside. Right. And it was so hot on Lundy that they were airlifting the sheep yes. off the island. Really? You're not listening, are yes, you? Yes, I am. I am. They were I airlifting am. sheep yeah. off an island. They do that. That they... merits more than just the, oh, really? No, no. Oh, really? But they do How that. How often do you think they do that? They do that in, in, uh, on Scottish islands quite a lot, and they also do it on Anglesey. Rubbish. Because our air valley is on Anglesey, yes, which is true. the only... Where Prince William used to work. Where, where Prince William used to work, and the only RAF station in the whole of the country which is guaranteed never to close due to weather conditions. Yes. OK, now let mm. me tell you a bit about it. It's uh, 150 years of the shipping forecast. It was uh, it was conceived by the founder of the Met Office, a guy called Robert Fitzroy. Oh, yeah. A dreadful storm hit the Irish Sea on the 25th of October, 1859. 800 people were killed. Oh, dear. 133 ships were sunk. Uh-huh. Sunk? Uh-huh. How about that? Uh, with 90 more damage. Mr. Fitzroy began to... Was this to... just around the British Isles? That was in the Irish Sea. No, just in the Irish Sea. It was the Irish Sea, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Uh, got to remember that uh, Liverpool was the world's biggest port in those yeah. days, and so the volume of traffic coming in out of Liverpool mm. would have accounted for a lot of those ships, yeah. OK? Now, uh, after the disaster, Mr Fitzroy began to create predictions of national storm warnings. Right. He said this, will, this tragedy could be averted in the future by warning people. The public demand for forecasts was very strong, and in 1867, the shipping forecast became a fixed feature of British maritime navigation. Oh, yeah. In 1925, mm. it was taken on by the BBC, and it's remained there ever since. Yeah. It's transmitted I mean, four times a day. I'm wondering uh, if 150-odd years ago, every yeah. ship would have even had a radio to hear that. I mean, would they have got it some other way rather than just, say, you know, on a radio broadcast, if you know what I mean? Uh, do you know what? I think initially it went out in Morse code. OK. Right? Yeah. And uh, That would make sense. Yes, absolutely. Mm. And, then, and then I think it only went on to the radio for the first time in 1925, because mm. you're quite right, before that, not well, many... Well, certainly not a lot of boats yeah. would have had radio, no, no. would they? No, that's right. Mm. Uh, exactly. But um, I went on a fantastic boating expedition, by the way, in uh, Greece. You did? Yeah. Tell me about it. Uh, there was a place called, um, we were in a, on a beach one day. Fair Isle, a... Cromarty, Viking. Remember yeah. all those names? Well, yeah, Shipping I forecast. do. Well, that's yeah. what I'm saying. That's why Lundy Island yeah. Yeah, exactly. became such a yeah. major thing for me when yeah. I went there. Anyway, tell me about your ship. Uh, yeah, well, it wasn't, it was more of a boat, really. Yeah. Um, and I it think was you run... sent me a picture of it, didn't you? Uh, well, I, was, I took a load of pictures on the boat. Mm. Kids loved it because mm. uh, Captain Dimitris was the guy in charge. Dimitris? Captain Dimitris. Sounds like somebody out of Zorba the Greek. Yeah. Well, it would do. He's yeah. Greek, you yeah, know. That's right. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, you were in Greece. Yeah, and we mm. were just around the corner from from Lindos, and we found this uh, the, a lot of these posters, not posters, mm. sort of you know um, uh, leaflets, yes. saying you know, book Captain Demetrius. You know, yeah. uh, he goes out uh, twice a day, blah blah yeah. blah, yeah. and it's called Lazy Lindos and all that. Mm. And we we chartered the boat just for the four of us, rather yes. than going on it with the great unwashed, as you would call yes, them. Yes, okay. And it was fantastic. Right. Had a couple of beers, did a bit of swimming, diving mm. off the edge of the boat into okay. the sea. So how long did you go out for? Brilliant. Three hours. How much did it cost you? Uh, Two hundred. 
euros. 200, oh, it's 200 quid, like, these yeah, days. Well, yeah, well, it is these yeah. days, yeah. Okay, so you kept the great and washed but off the boat we, well, by chartering gone, it for yourself. Well, if we'd gone on with a load of other people, because mm, yeah. he brought a load of other people in just yes. before we got on it, and there yes. was about 20 people on the boat, right? right yeah. So there would be nowhere to swing a cat. No, no, exactly. And, uh, and it would have been cost us 120 to, to do it that way, so I thought we might as well just take the whole thing for ourselves. So did it say you can hire this boat for your own individual yeah. uh yeah, trip. private private crew. What about all the rest of the people in the queue who wanted to get on the boat for the well, next no, trip? Well, no, because we'd booked it, you see. Oh, I see. And so when we went to meet him, he was bringing people in, yeah. having been out oh, with see. them yeah, for yeah. about six hours. And then six you booked hours. it for your own personal crew. Yeah, it was Very lovely. Good. It was Very really good. nice. And do you know what the name of the bay was no. where we were staying? No, tell and me. where we did a bit of swimming? Tell me. Navarone Bay. Navarone. Now, does that ring a bell with you? It certainly does. That will have been the basis for that famous thriller book, The Guns of Navarone. And the movie starring Anthony Quinn. That's right, yeah. Which was shot in the very place where my villa was. Is that right? Yeah. Well, that's incredible, it's a great big it? cliff. So I'm yeah. going to I'm gonna maybe buy you, I'm thinking, yeah. a copy of The Guns of Navarone. Yeah, we'll talk to about... To watch, because then you can think of me when you're watching a war film. Tell me about buying, talking about buying things. Yeah. When do I get my present from... Uh... You'll get your present, don't worry. Yeah, you sure yeah, you bought worry. me one? Of course I got you one. You just one. hoped I'd forget about it, didn't well, you? Well, you know... And then we slide out I of the always studio bring you, at no. one o'clock and all of a sudden, you know, I'm left well, I'm not presentless. Sure I, well, I think I brought it with me. I'm not sure. I'll have to check. Oh, really? I think yeah. so. Because I yeah. left in a bit of a hurry this morning because I woke up this morning. Mm, mm. You don't forget, I've been doing nothing yeah. for a week, right? Yeah. yeah. And suddenly I had yeah. to oh, find no, myself... I know you've been doing nothing for a week, pal. Doing don't worry some work. about that. Now, how about this from Richard who says, mm. Welcome back. He says, Any chance of a shout-out? It's my 14th wedding anniversary mm. to the lovely Laura. Lovely and Laura. this is Richard from the West Country. Lovely Laura, Laura Maiden. That was Rita, oh, wasn't that's it? that's Rita, but, yeah. uh, Okay, so what is it? The uh, 14th, 14th wedding anniversary. A strange sort of uh, Why? celebration. 14th, isn't it? It's not exactly a landmark one, is it? Well, it was for me. Yeah, was it? Was oh, was it that was, the last one? That wasn't a 15th. Yeah, that was the last one. Yeah, it wasn't a 15th. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah very good. Uh, so it's Laura. It's 14th wedding anniversary. Yeah. Laura, yeah. have a great 14th. Yes. What's the name of the chap who sent uh, the Richard. Stuff? So, Richard and Laura, I want you to have a great 14th wedding anniversary. Mm -hmm. And remember, you have many, many, many happy years ahead of you. I say that with a bit of a sigh in case uh, the curse of MG <laughs> strikes you because he's also reminded you he's never got to a 15. Yeah. I am certain yours will. I'm sure you will. Mm. Uh, this is Talk Radio. Yeah. The 21st century dream team of dialogue, debate and discourse. The two mics on Talk, Talk Radio. Radio. We'll get you talking. <laughs> James has uh, tweeted us saying he's listening live from sunny Cyprus, which I'm sure is a beautiful place to be at this time of yeah, the year. Certainly I'm, I'm Greece sure it is. is gorgeous. Yeah. Uh, Wrong Star says, Merman, mm. the only fish tail pork he can manage, mm. is in the wet doing 90 down the M1. Oh, that's a bit harsh. Yeah. That sounds like you uh, brand him as a reckless driver. Uh, well, certainly you wouldn't want to be called that. No. But we'll talk some more about motorway driving Definitely. in a little while. Because mm. right now, something far more important uh, has come up. And yep. we have to talk to the legendary Liz Brewer about that's it, right? right? Because uh, she knows all there is to know about etiquette, about dinner parties. Mm. I don't remember the last time you invited me to a dinner party, actually. Well, I, I've, I, I've hardly ever been to a dinner party. Right. I mean, you know, to me, it's just like... It's not something I've ever been into. Probably because... But you I've, must have had a time in your career when yeah. you were invited to lots of dinner parties. I, I, I have, I have. I turned a lot of them down. Because after the first one, it's a bit like, you know when you go on a cruise and on the first night you find yourself seated at a table with well, three I'll or four cruise. bores yeah. and, and that's it. You'd be one of them, the trip. wouldn't you? No, I wouldn't. I was the one who, who actually lightened and heightened company. Well, hang on, you've I, just admitted to standing yeah. up in an Italian restaurant and seeing yeah. life as a minestrone that's right. to a bunch of guests who didn't presumably expect that to happen. But I got a round of applause afterwards because I Engage the, stopped. I can gauge the company. Uh -huh. And I always found dinner parties a bit of a lottery, really, because you might like the people sitting around the yeah. table, but you might not. I must admit, I didn't enjoy dinner parties yeah. when I was doing a lot of them. But yeah. let's talk to Liz Brewer, because she'll be able to tell us what is going on now, because apparently there's a perfect number mm. if you wish to have a successful right. dinner party. Liz, a very good morning to you. Welcome good to the show. Good morning to you, both of you. Yes, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining mm. us. Now, I mean, I've been listening to you and watching you giving out etiquette advice for probably more years than, than both of us would care to remember. But did <laughs> Did you know? Did you know that there was a sort of a, multipli a multiplication answer to how many people to have at dinner party? I think it's a load of rubbish. Do you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I absolutely. 
absolutely do. I mean, I don't know where, who are these people that find the time to decide whether we should have multiples of four and yeah. how many of us. The whole idea of a dinner party, whether you like it or not, um, is to gather friends around and, as they do admit, you know, keep the wine flowing mm. um, because it relaxes people and people start bonding. And it's really just to sort of communicate. Mm. Mm. And in today's world, I think any getting together, we spend so much of our time, you know, on the radio or, you know, behind a computer. Mm. And we need to get out and actually physically communicate with other people mm. and chat to them and talk and gossip and discuss the world, sure. keeping off preferably politics and mm. Donald Trump and various <laughs> other things like Well, that. that's the interesting thing, isn't it? Because nowadays, Liz, I mean, it's almost impossible to get through a day without finding out everything that's going on. Whereas, you know, when I was mm. sort of doing a lot of dinner parties back in probably the no, late 80s. You did 80s, a lot of dinner parties, did you? I did, yeah, because yeah. there, there was a time, I think when you're in your 30s. You never invited me to any. No, I didn't. Of course because... you did. Everybody, they, got their, they had spaghetti parties, I remember. Yeah. You know, because in those days, it was students or young people who mm. got together. But the whole idea was to actually sit at a table yeah. and sit together. Now, when it talks about this, this survey, which has decided that the perfect mm. number is multiples of four, yeah. the, the whole idea of sitting down at a table is to be able to communicate. Therefore, mm. however, whatever the number, if you're a long table, you can't communicate. You can only no. communicate with those immediately near you. That's right. So my advice is always try and have a round table. Mm. Round table or stick to numbers where people can actually all join in a conversation. Yeah. I, I, That's know, a good idea. But I'm also, totally of course, good. I'm going to point something out mm. that Mr. Parry will not like me pointing out mm. because he and I have known each other far too long as well. Mm. Now, I remember a time when one of your girlfriends was rather cruelly dumped by you was she? because you regarded Ooh. he was starting to get invited to the editor's dinner parties, right? And he decided mm. that because he now had quite a highfalutin kind of executive position yeah. at the Daily Express, that mm. he should find a better, uh, shall we say, suited girlfriend because his, yeah, his girlfriend true. was only a secretary. <laughs> no, Liz, that is true. It's true. That is true. That I is just, unbelievable. Isn't that shocking? No, no, I felt that she wasn't up to the intellectual level that I needed to go to these dinner <laughs> parties. And the other thing you say about the long table, Liz, is the grovellers always got into the room first after the initial, you know, drinks in the in the parlour. But surely the, to... place, the place names said it all, didn't Yeah, they? yeah. Oh, yeah, but I wasn't averse to getting in before everybody else moving. And, and moving the place names to get me right close Just to the most important you guest. You did that unforgivable sin and moved the place names. I did, I did, oh, yeah, yeah. I, I got closer to the most a, important people. That is and, disgraceful. Uh, Somebody has taken, you think, yeah. time to mm. work it out. Yeah. Who should I sit where? You know, you could no. couple people, you could have business deals no. done, all kinds of things. I but wanted you, to be either next to the most important person in the room or the best-looking woman. Now, you oh, see, this well, is of another. You would do. Of course, th- you would do. This is another problem I had, Liz, for my, uh, all my life. Nobody else shared that no, particular no, view. No, no, no. Hang on, hang on. For most of my life, I've been single. Okay. Because you well, know, all of it. I, 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 now, why, Mike? Why have you always been? Well, single? it just never happened to me, and I've always just got on with the job and all that kind of stuff. Is now, that the problem because is, because you chose girlfriends because you thought they'd be appropriate. That's one of the reasons. Well, well, maybe. the other reasons is he's a hideous personality. Uh, no, that's that's very <laughs> unkind. But Liz, you see that now that made that made me a very tasty catch for you know women who were always trying to palm their best friend off on me because I was a great you know catch. You know, I was a sort You're of. A great were you a tasty yeah. cat? Yes, I was. I was a senior executive in Fleet Street. You know, I was suave, Workaholic. educated. And uh, and so if there was, so, you know, the person giving the dinner party suddenly yeah. had a friend who just split up with her husband or something, they were trying to matchmake them with me all the time. And, and that's it didn't a, work. No, it didn't work. That's a terrible pressure. Astonishing, to be, isn't it, that it didn't work? To be, but I mean, yeah. Yeah, but that happens at dinner parties, isn't it? The person holding the dinner party is always trying to matchmake. And that, that's right. Well, they're trying to put people together that they think mm, is mm. going to be conducive to bringing out yeah. wonderful conversation. Yeah. And so that you enjoy yourself. You don't. Just remember the food. What you remember is yeah. the atmosphere and the people you meet. That yes. you go to any party, you come mm. away. You that's what you remember. You can have all those wonderful ingredients, fabulous mm. food, wonderful decor, mm. decor. But at the end of the day, mm. it's how you've enjoyed yourself, who yeah. you've met, mm. the kind of things that that's the kind of things you remember. Mm. 
With a long table, incidentally, one of the things I've often said is what you have to do mm. is move people around. So mm. between courses, if you are stuck at one end of the table, at least mm. you can push, you know, yeah. as it were, turn turn the table around so people have a chance of actually sort of conversation. Yeah, but if, if you're getting on very well... I have to the... say, looking back, though, on yeah. those kind of what you might call... Um, you guppified um, dinner parties mm. where people were all vying for attention and trying to get the, the names mm. up, you know, near the boss and trying to talk to the boss's wife and all that. I find that all ghastly, really, now, and I can't imagine anyone well, still doing it. That's a different kind of dinner party, isn't it? Dinner parties with the boss, where you've got to be mm. or supposed to be on your best behaviour. Yeah. Mm. I think we're talking about sort of the general dinner party, not yeah. one that you have to sort of. Um, but there's a social strata, isn't it? The yeah. social strata. I mean, for instance, you go to a dinner party, you suddenly find that a not too famous pop star from like 10 years ago is mm. suddenly there and people automatically, oh, fame, you know, this guy wants top the charts. It's all that kind of stuff, isn't it? Well, it's rather nice to know some of those old timers do mm. come back. Mm. They're not just f- forgotten about and, yeah. you know, put in a put, yeah. put in yeah. I'm, I'm just surprised that, that dinner parties are still a thing, to be honest. I just, I don't know whether you well, think... of course they're a thing. Are they? Going out to dinner, restaurants can be quite expensive all the time. Mm. And that's why people love doing up their homes and having nice kitchens or if yeah. they're lucky enough to have a dining room nowadays. Mm. But it's a gathering of people. It's pulling people together. And we need to do that more mm. and more. Young people growing up need to be able to communicate with others, others on a one-to-one or with friends mm. on a personal basis, not just through the, the medium of a computer. Yeah. Or an iPhone, or um, mm. I mean, an iPhone, but a, a mobile phone. Yeah. You need to be able to communicate because we do have a whole nation of kids growing up, and a lot yeah. of them, you know, they they don't know about. Cities. And well, I mean, and the biggest problem with the and... with the next generation of kids growing up is getting them out of the house. To mm. be honest, you know, so that they're not hanging around yeah. in their parents' uh, the... living room most spot of the time. On, spot yeah. on. So yeah. dinner parties, like when we grew up, we did have. We got together as friends. We loved it. We didn't worry too much about the. Food food, as yeah. long as we had the wine flowing, it, it created great conversation, and that's, that was what we enjoyed. Mass drunkenness, it yeah, sounds well, yeah. to yeah, me we like. Didn't but, get but, drunk. But, but, Liz, can I tell you this <laughs> as well? They didn't the, get mass drunk. Yeah, one of, the advents of the, one of the advantages of the advent of the mobile phone, of course, mm. is getting out of a dinner party, because you tell your best mate or somebody, uh, you know, somebody close to you, ring me after an hour and a half, you know, and then what you can... get away? Yeah, exactly. You can pretend that, you know, oh, no... But this is another part of his terrible yeah. personality yeah. where he pretended you know, he was more important. You dinner parties, yeah. and there is that problem. You're sat between two people, and yeah. you suddenly realise, my goodness, I've got to be here for the next two and a half hours That's right. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. But there are ways to lighten that, and I, I, I've done it, and I've been wicked at it, but yes. sat there... And it's been a bit of a challenge. So I've I've started the conversation with something which might slightly shock them, but it sort of brings the the, the bore of the dinner yeah. out of his shell. And you just say, well, by the way, tell me, when did you first lose your virginity? Mm. And the guy sits up and he can't believe you've actually said that. Yes. But in the end, it actually, it sort of, uh, it just lightens the conversation. An icebreaker. Well, a, a yeah. big ice. Yeah, that's so right, that yeah. And what about the food? I mean, you say the food isn't particularly mm. necessarily you know, uh, memorable, food, but, I mean, people do get nervous about cooking for others, don't they? I know they shouldn't because food is food. I mean, people rave about fabulous food and we're obsessed nowadays with mm. cookery programmes and menus. But in actual fact, at the end of the day, you're there to communicate and to chat to people, and food is uh, fabulous and mm. wonderful. And if it is impressive, then we talk about it. But it's not the most important ingredient. Yeah. The most important thing is to create an atmosphere. Yeah. So well, things- uh, I know what you mean. Can I tell you one Mind incident? Mind you, if you go to a place where they don't know how to cook, yeah, that can also Well, be here, here's one incident, Liz, which is unforgivable, I think, the manners of the person holding the dinner party. He invited me to a dinner party. I went there, you know. And then revealed that as they were vegetarian, they were going to serve um, a vegetable bolognese. No meat in it at all. Now, now... Well, you're lucky you got that. I went to a Christmas dinner party yeah. once where they were vegans, yeah. and they had this turkey that looked like a turkey, yeah. but it was totally meatless. It was in the shape of a turkey, and it was absolutely disgusting. What was it made of? I have no Corn idea. 
<laughs> yeah, like corn or... Vegetables, yes. I mean, but it was brown and looked a bit roasted. It but sounds it like the Faulty Towers version. You know, take off the silver lid and all of a sudden you've got blancmange underneath instead of a turkey. <laughs> Or a no. dock or whatever it was. That is very weird. Well, mm. listen, Liz, well, we should continue yeah. to uh, seek your advice on various yeah. matters, Thank if we you, may. Liz. Thank you very much for joining us. Mm. Uh, the dinner party, perfect dinner party, according to the Oxford University mm. study, uh, is in multiples of four only. That's right. Which I don't really go for. You've, used, tell the, you. uh, you've used the trick, haven't you, about getting out of a meeting by getting somebody to ring no. you half an hour in. No, I use it all that. the time. Yeah, I know, but that's because you're and, a charlatan. And, and, and in fact, actually, because nobody ever knows what you're texting on your phone, yeah. you just say, oh, I'm awfully sorry, I've just got to reply to yeah. this text. In fact, what I'm texting is, go out. ring me immediately, I can't stop. Damn this bunch of bores I'm with. Get me out of here. It's difficult to do that if you're sitting in close proximity it's to not, someone. Though. It's not. Been like people have stare right. at your mobile Well, phone. next time you disappear off, I'll know yeah, why. Exactly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Coming up in the next hour, though, we've got to ask mm. Porky. So if you've never had a question answered yep. live on the air, if yep. you've never actually had a problem solved live mm. on the air, now's the time to do it. Mm. You can post on Facebook at the Two Mics page, uh, or you can follow us on Twitter and do it there. Uh, with, we are the Two Mics. This is Talk Radio. Across the UK, online and on DAB. It's a new frontier in broadcast. The Two Mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Graham, he's Mike Parry. You're listening to The Two Mics right here on Talk Radio. We're here today and tomorrow, and also Monday, by the way, uh, which is a bank holiday, yep. uh, shortly after our visit to Sky Studio. That's so right, doing to a review the papers. Uh, paper reviewing business. Yep. Uh, and no doubt, when we mm. do that, there will be uh, all sorts of interesting stories around. We were talking to Rob Johnson a little bit earlier on yep. about Princess Diana and how August is a silly season. One of the things that I can't yes. go one day now mm-hmm. without seeing mm-hmm. uh, is a story about something to do with electric cars, something to do with the fact that yep. electric cars are going to ruin the planet, uh, you know, we're not going to have enough electricity. That's right. You're obviously on the side of those who say that it's not ready mm-hmm. time. Uh, mm-hmm. We can't really do it yet. But yeah. we're going to talk now to a guest called Malcolm Grimstone. That's right. Uh, who's honorary re- senior researcher at the Centre for Energy Policy and yes. Technology yes. at Imperial College, yeah. uh, which is one of those colleges that you, I would imagine, would think is very, very high up on the scale I certainly of would. academia. Yeah. Uh, we're going to find out from Malcolm what he thinks of this story, which mm. says that there's now not enough power to plug electric cars in to your home and boil a kettle at the same time. Or put on the electric oven. Yeah. Or now, put on the electric now shower. This all came from the National Grid. I yes. would have thought the National Grid people would be a little bit more adventurous. Well, except they've got, a, they've got to buy the electricity. And we've yeah, already yeah. had a report that we've discussed on this show yeah. that we'll need 10 new nuclear-powered stations no, to produce enough no. electricity to power all the cars by 2040. Rubbish. No, because the point is, it's surely, and as we've had other experts mm. on the show before, to tell us, yeah. uh, there will be advances made in the in the in the creation of electricity. You hope. there will be advances made in the in the way that batteries operate inside of you cars. You know, massive as well. batteries the size of no. uh, concrete blocks and no, suitcases. They won't be. Yeah. Let's talk to Malcolm and find out. Yeah. Malcolm, very good afternoon to you. Afternoon. Hi. Thank you very much for joining yeah. us. Now, this is. I mean, the trouble with this story, and, and and I feel that this is the problem in most kind of areas of, of, of British life now, is that it all gets polarised by people who have one view or a different view. You know, if you're a, a sort of a flat earth type, you don't want there to be electric cars, you want there to be, there's lots of stories about how terrible it's going to be, about how there's not going to be enough electricity and how we're never going to be able to, to, to generate enough of it. And if you're a kind of a free thinking green person, you're going to say, well, of course we must have electric cars because otherwise we're all going to die from the, from the pollution. So where do you stand on it, Malcolm? Well, I think like... Oops, Malcolm, we've lost you there. He swallowed his phone. Mm. Are you there, Malcolm? No, I'm afraid your phone has become inoperable. No, maybe he's been standing too near a generator. Yeah, or something like that, yeah. yeah. We'll try yeah. and get him back. It but just sounds as though the phone just disappeared. He hasn't dropped it, it in the swimming pool or something. It sounds like he swallowed it. Yeah, that's right, he did, yeah. That's what I would have said. Yeah. Um, look, I mean, this uh, this row goes on, doesn't it, all the time? Mm. You know, people of one persuasion or another. Yeah, but, but, I mean, what, I am... but what worries me is it's yeah. not fact-based. It's based purely and simply on kind of ideology. It's based on common sense. No, it's not. And common sense tells you that the, we've been warned over the last two or three winters that if we don't do something about the supply of electricity in this country, we'll have blackouts if we have a very yeah, tough that's, winter. That's rubbish. So if we're going to have blackouts with what we've got rubbish. at the moment to provide electricity, what are we going to have in terms of blackouts when, say, 10 million cars, just a quarter well, of the number of cars in this country, well, are driving around on batteries. Well, let's see if Malcolm has figured out how to work his phone. Malcolm, are you there? 
Yeah, I'm sorry about that. It's a, it's a testament to the uh, unreliability of technology, actually, which is what we're talking about. Exactly. Well, um, exactly. I mean, broadly speaking, the, the, one of the key issues is it's not so much the total amount of electricity we generate, mm. it's when we use it, because at the moment, because we can't store electricity in meaningful amounts, and, yeah. and you know, batteries are obviously a way forward on that, uh, then we're using vast amounts of electricity around tea time in late January, mm-hmm. we're using much, much less in the middle of the, uh, yeah, middle of the night, in the middle of the Right, I'm not sure we can we can we can count you as any kind of a proper source on this, Malcolm. Yeah, if you, you can't, can't work out phone. your phone. <laughs> God's no, sake, no, man! No. But uh, perhaps I'm a. I mean, <laughs> What's well, going on here? I mean, you know, the Martians gonna, have landed. I mean, you're the guy that organises mm. guests, right? I mean, mm. you know, you're the man that's hoping to get this guy to back yeah. you up, right? Mm. You can't even work a phone. Mm. Well, I mean, yes, it's from Imperial listen, College. Listen. We have people called uh, producers and technicians and people like that yeah. who are supposed to be able to provide a means of communication yeah. between this well, studio at Talk you. Radio let me just tell and, you. and our outside Malcolm, uh, guests. Malcolm Grinston is honorary senior researcher at the Centre of Energy Policy yes. and Technology. Yes, but getting energy, a phone that works. getting energy into a mobile phone appears to be one of the it's problems that he's got to contend with. Well, let me give you this message instead, which is a rather nice message from mm. Jeff, mm-hmm. uh, who said, we'd like you to please to say hi to my son Daniel, who just came out of hospital yesterday with pneumonia and septicemia. Mm. Uh, we nearly lost him, but for the great people at Leicester Royal Infirmary wow. who saved his life. Well, I want to congratulate the people at Leicester Royal Infirmary and say to the parents, you know, we're so very pleased for you because what a trauma you've been through. But fortunately and hopefully, well, almost certainly now, because he's out of hospital, the trauma will have ended on a happy note. So mm. that's a great uh, plus. Francis says this, mm. I can't think of anything worse than a d- dinner party. A good old mm. pub crawl and a decent curry at the end of the night would suit me. Well, uh, I think the curry at the end of the night's gone as well, you know, because funny enough, you know, I was in Chester last weekend. Yeah. And by the way, have I mm. told you about how dreadful the motorways are in this country? Well, you started telling me. I mean, half of the motorways I drove on, and mm. I drove on the M40, I drove yeah. on the M42, I yeah. drove on the M6, I how drove the on the M1. the M69 Triangle? Uh, I nearly had to go on the M69 Triangle when I got a message saying there's a big crash on the M1. Yeah. But fortunately, it was just north of the junction I was joining on, on the M6. Oh, well, I'm all right. All However, right then. I then encountered a big crash on the M25. But can I tell you? Yeah. The amount of these uh, restricted, you know, average parking check cameras are yeah. around has reduced half of the motorway network in this country by average, an insidious plan. Average speeding check. Average speeding yeah, check to average 50, 50 miles, uh, yeah, speeding, not yeah. parking, to 50 miles an hour. Mm. It's, it's a damned outrageous assault on the freedom of the motorist in yeah. this country. How did you find driving around Chester? Your home city? Uh, I didn't drive around Chester. I oh, drove no. to the Dorchester of the North, put yeah. it in the car park at the back, and then went on foot because Chester is a compact city. Yes, I see. That's right. You know, well, good. Like, like an well, Indian. Well, look, we've now got uh, Malcolm Grinch. like a Native American. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> we've now got yeah. Malcolm back. Yeah. I think on a landline now. Great. Malcolm, how's, the, yeah, how's it going down there at the better. Technology yeah. Centre of Imperial yes. College? Yes. I'm, I'm severely concerned mm. about the uh, the wherewithal of your like, expert yeah. knowledge here. Yeah. <laughs> now, yeah. listen. Um, you're going to, you know, I'm interested in one of the first things you said, that we still don't have a very sort of um, good way of, of storing electricity. Why don't we? Well, it's because electricity isn't a stuff, it's a process. Mm. You know, if you've got a stuff like oil or uranium or gas or whatever, mm. you can put it in suitable barrels and keep it as long as you like. Electricity is things moving Hang about. On. And on. that means in is... effect, you've got to... Yeah transfer that electricity into something else to mm. store it. Well, that's what a battery and, is, isn't it? Yeah. And then turn it back into electricity. And that's exactly what a battery is. Or you can pump water uphill and run it down. I think your battery's <laughs> running out here, <laughs> Alco. <laughs> Awfully sorry. There's a shocking... This is uh, third time. This is, Gremlins. You're responsible Gremlins. for this, Porky. Gremlins in the system. Let me just carry on, because I'm sure the line will get better. Carry on, Mel. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. So, um, we've been trying to store electricity for well over two centuries now. Mm. Every ten years we hear about a great break. Have you got any phones down at Imperial College that work? No, I'm at home at the moment. Oh, you're at home? Oh, at home, yeah. If I was in Imperial, would be... Would be uh, Have would you be paid the phone there. bill? Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know if you can hear out what I'm saying, but the, so the, the aim has always been to come up with... Uh, this, but the quantity of electricity we're talking about that would need to be stored is just extraordinary. So huge. We'd be, we'd, we'd be talking about several thousand times the battery mm. mm. we've got now. There are big pollution complications with that. Yeah. What about noise pollution? Ideally, we want to move to a state where we mm. can generate electricity pretty much as it's required. Yes. So if we charge the cars overnight when demand is low uh, and uh, we may be able to use power stations that aren't needed for other purposes, mm. maybe a way 
afford one. It's, yeah. not, it's not so much the total amount of electricity we're yeah. generating. It's can we, can we do it at a yeah. time when we're not using it for other uses? Yeah. Malcolm, when a car's got going, when you've initially started the engine, got it going, why doesn't it generate its own electricity? Surely you can turn the wheels into electricity generators. Like a dynamo. You? Yeah, like dynamos. Uh, that's, that's a perpetual motion machine. You're still having to put energy... You have to put more energy in than you get out. Mm. Actually, new hybrid cars, in effect, do that when you're braking. Uh, the energy of the brake doesn't just go to waste, it goes back into feeding the battery. So you can do that to an extent. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you've still got the choice. Do you run it on something like petrol, mm. which is always going to have significant local environmental effects? Mm. Or can we move over to electricity? Much, much cleaner at point of use, so mm. great for city air. Mm. But, of course, we've got to generate the electricity in a way that helps environmentally, particularly as far as climate change goes. Yes. And those are the two big challenge at the moment. First of the battery technology itself, it yeah. tends to be heavy. Yeah. It tends to take a long time to charge up, which is the real problem, I think, mm. as well as range. Yeah. Uh, but then also, can we generate enough, enough electricity cleanly for nuclear power or whatever it happens to be? Okay. Uh, rather than having to use gas and, and coal like we do at the moment. Well, yes. gas, not yes. so much coal. Okay. Okay. Sure, sure. All right. sure. Listen, we're going to okay. have to leave it there, I'm afraid, Malcolm, uh, because, Malcolm, we're, we're, still, we're still technologically challenged, yeah. I'm yeah. afraid, and yeah. since we are a radio station, it's kind of important that's how right. it sounds, really, isn't yes, it? Yes, that's right. It's yeah. hopeless of you to find a guy like that. Nothing to do with me. Really? And I uh, very much resent you trying to, you know, pass uh, over Quality to me. Quality control must have been um, awful uh, last week. Problems Horrendous. which are outside of my control. Yeah. Now then, did you know that um, we are in an elite um, proportion of 10% of the population? We are in, a, what you see, you and I. Who live in two different homes. Uh, really? One in 10 adults yeah. now has a second home. Okay. Well, what One in mean, 10 in this country. Well, they own them. Yeah, one in ten adults. Well, you own, you own, I believe, eight homes. Is that right? Uh, I, I'm, I'm can't comment on that. Well, no. you can comment on no, it can't. because when no. you did the Alan Brazil um, warm-up show yes. on Saturday, yes. I received a tweet from several people mm. who said uh, the secret is now out. No. Porky has been outed as owning eight homes. Uh, Those were the words of Alan Brazil. Uh, well, that was Al's uh, version of events. I did not comment on it. I'm not commenting on this. Are you no, saying you don't own eight homes? Listen, listen, listen to this report. Yeah, it says, on. some 5.2 million Britons own at least two properties, uh-huh. up by 30% since 2002. Right. Half of these homes are owned by wealthy baby boomers. Those born from 46 to 65, that yeah. includes you and I. Yes, okay? that's true. Uh, most of whom live in southern England. Yeah. So, Which also know, includes you and I. It, it does include you and I. Another mm-hmm. quarter are owned by the generation after them, those born from 66 to 80. Right. Now, they're the ones... What are they called? Because baby boomers finish at 65. Yeah, so, that's right. So yeah. what are the, what's the next lot? Generation X. Ah, yes, OK. They're known as Generation mm. X. And they, in fact, were the last group, the last mm. lucky group of people born who got to an age of house buying responsibility yeah. when houses were still affordable. Yes. And I'm afraid since Generation X... Now. Exactly. No. Since, since if you came after Generation X, you've had mm. it. Well, my daughter says to me all the time, "I'm never mm. going to be able to afford to buy no, a house." Exactly. I said, "You're quite right." Exactly. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Well, it is amazing. Yeah. Uh, because I think a lot of people who now can't afford to buy a home, yeah, uh, or who have to rent because they haven't got enough money together to put a deposit down, yes, will be pretty horrified to hear that so many people have actually got more than one. Yes, that's right. I think they? they will. I think they will. Mm. Now, the other fact here, and this could involve me. Four in ten adults do not own a prop- any property. Right now, I'm thinking of I flogging. Don't know any. I, you know, I'm thinking of flogging all my property. Are you? Um, Why? But, well, because I thought, hang on, if I live in a property, say for instance, which is worth four hundred and fifty thousand, right? If you do, if I do, not saying you do. Uh, no, no, if I do. Yeah. Why on earth am I sitting on four hundred fifty thousand pounds worth of bricks, which yeah. I use half the time because I've got a second home? Yeah. Why don't I flog the first one? Yes. And then I take that four hundred fifty grand. Yeah. And I'll I do buy, what with it? Well, I buy an Aston Martin to start off with, right. OK? Well, that still leaves you 350 Yes, right? that's right. I would then live very lavishly, <laughs> uh, OK? And no, but it would be wasted on you. How, how, no. how can you live more lavishly than you do now? What would you do? Well, I w- You don't I'm... like going on holiday, no. right? No. You don't particularly like going no. out to expensive restaurants. No. I, I, what would you do? I, I haven't got an Aston Martin. I want one before I die. Well, get an I'm Aston, get Martin. Aston Martin. Yeah, well, that's get fine. One. Yeah, I'm going to get one. But you don't have to sell no. off all your property. No, I don't. But I'm, what I'm saying is I'd rather, like, leave an Aston Martin to my nephew than leave a home. I think you'd rather you left him a house, to be he honest. He probably would, yeah. But the point I'm making yeah. is this, that I would then become one of the renting fraternity. Yeah. Because I'd then go and rent... There's nothing wrong with that. I'd go and rent a very nice home. Yeah. Maybe for about, you know, two or three grand a month or something yeah. like that. You see what I mean? Yeah. And then spend the money... So that it's gone when I die, yeah, and not die with like. Well, you there's know. no point going to going to, to hell or heaven or wherever no. you're going to end up with a load of money. Do you know why? Why coffins don't have pockets? Uh, what coffins don't have pockets? 
No, that's, my mantra, sure. that's my new mantra in life. I'm sure that if yeah. you wanted to put a coffin with some pockets in it, no. I'm sure they'd build one no, for you. No, but that's like, you know, that's like goes right back to putting gold coins in sailors' eyes. Really? To transport them to the next world. I think world. you've been doing a lot of crazy thinking no, in my absence, no, haven't you? No, no, been... so this is the, So you've come up with this plan yeah. that you're going to just liquidate all of your property. Maybe. Okay. And then do other things with it. Well, why don't you give me a load of money and I'll buy something. Maybe give it away to charity. Give it to me. Give it to me. Just give it to me. Do you know Bill Gates has given away about something like 40 yeah. billion billion well, dollars. He lost the, and he's still the richest man in well, the world. Well, yeah, but he lost it briefly, didn't he? To Very the briefly, bloke. and then he came back again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we shall see. Yeah. Uh, lots more to come mm-hmm. right here, including Ask Porky. Yeah. Uh, we are the two mics on yeah. Talk Radio. The 21st century dream team of dialogue, debate and discourse. The two mics on Talk, Talk Radio. Radio. We'll get you talking. Two mics. This is, of course, Talk sure Radio. Are. Ask Porky's coming up very shortly. A yeah. couple of uh, tweets on that last guest that yeah, you organised. Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Danny says, my head hurts after that guest Porky organised. I didn't organise And organize it's horrendous it. phone connection. I did not organise it. And, and uh, uh, I am not taking responsibility. Uh, well, okay? you should. JP Case says, what the hell is this? Get a proper guest on who can speak without turbulence. Uh, Typical Mike Parry expert. Uh, Where do you find these people? Uh, I don't find them. Uh, we find them as yeah. a collective group. We I research see. them. And then uh, if things go wrong, uh, because I mean, of the you've been here for hours system. before I got here today, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, I was, yeah. 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 So, I, what, I mean, is that, we, that's, is that the fruits of your uh, no, labours? No, my preparation is always far more precise really? and uh, determined and uh, in-depth than yours. OK, now how about this? Paul in Hove says, yeah. tell Porky, uh, if you don't spoil yourself, nobody else will. Mm. Life ain't a rehearsal, so yeah. go for it before it's too late. Thank you. God I bless you, mate, and you bring us fun and joy. Yeah, that's right. Thank so you very much people indeed. are saying you should actually yeah. spend a load of money. So if Nat, though, yeah. says, Porky would end up in rehab mm. uh, if he lived lavishly yeah. Yeah, and well, got obliterated. Well, no, there is a risk of yeah, that. Yeah, there is a risk of that as well. And you've got to watch... Uh, you see, I think we should all be able to estimate how long we live, and then I'd know how much money I can spend before well, I, I die. Well, I can tell you, you're not going to live long. Yeah, well, you know... I mean, only 130 heart works, that, for that, start. That, that is all relative. Now, you see what I have in my hand here? Uh, I in see you have in your hand, and as uh, it's getting near to the end of the show, it's about to ask, where's the present? Well, Because I'm not going to ask nicely anymore. I'm not asking nicely, right? I want my present. Present. Oh, hang on, maybe I've forgotten to bring it. Don't be ridiculous. It's possible. Oh, hang no. On. I, sur- I scoured the yeah. whole island, you know, to find you something. No, you didn't. I you did. sca- no, didn't. I you scoured didn't. the entire island. No, you island didn't. In your bladderated Uzo state, roads. you just staggered around until you found something yes. cheap this enough. This is a beautiful, um, uh, what you can see here is a beautiful bag, yeah. right? Come on, it's give it a It's packaged in. personally yeah. uh, on the front. A Rodos. Yeah. Uh, yeah, which is the Greek yeah. name for Rhodes, right? Yeah, Rhodos. Rhodos. Yeah. Oh, it's all from Rhodos. Rhodos, yeah. yeah. And it's got like, uh, it's a beautiful uh, yeah. a beautiful picture of the Colossus of yeah. Rhodes, right? Well, come on, let's have which it. used to be, well, hang on a second. Yeah. Which used to be uh, a what stride. You show me an envelope for. What's well, in the envelope? Well, That's this the is a gift. Thing. It's a very expensive gift. Oh, yeah? All right? Yeah. And I'm going to give it to you now. And it's got, do you like the Greek, uh, you know, sort of a pattern around? Well, it's, it's, a got... bit, it's a few old Greek ruins, isn't it? Well, that's the, where yeah. the Colossus of Rhodes used oh, to sit. There right. you go. Look. Thank you. Okay. Right. Okay. You can't say that I didn't think of you. Yeah. You know because it's I always... a cheap envelope to start it off with. It's not a cheap envelope. Looks like it's had something else in it. No, it's nothing else in it at all. It's a reused that second no, hand envelope. No, it's not. No. It's a second hand envelope. In, the lady in the shop asked me if I wanted it gift wrapped, and I said yes. What did you say? Or oh, do you want this in Rhodes? Rhodes envelope. Why are you making okay? fun of the Greek people? Rhodes envelope. Is it right. a Rhodes envelope? It's lovely. Okay. What is really this? Nice. Is, is this uh, like a toy model of Zorba the Greek or something like that? How would you make a toy model of Zorba the Greek? You know, because he was a dancer, wasn't he? Right. Let me have a look. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you'll see what it is. Yeah. It's something very, very special. Right. It's a bit of junk. It's oh, no, not. Hang on. Let's see. No, it's got Rhodes written on the front. Yeah, Rhodes. Rhodes. Remind you, yeah. it's from Rhodes. Yeah. yeah. And then it's, uh, it's got a beautiful. Uh, it's beautifully designed. It's a donkey, is it? Handcrafted donkey. Yeah. It's a donkey, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a donkey. Do you shake it up? Yeah, shake it up. Look, it's like a snow machine, except it's actually got uh, fairy um, bits in it, you know? It's really nice. Look at that. It's tremendous. And also, along the bottom, don't forget, you've yeah. got um, sort of Rhodes Harbour, which has been put there. It's a bit of chalk it's base. Not... It's chalk it's base. It's beautiful. Look, look, look. What do you look, mean, chalk? Look. Made it cheap chalk. It's not cheap. Yeah, I, bet I paid a lot of money the, for that. Scratch the blue paint. No, I bet you that. can't. No. No, it's for your collection. So, you not... So what's the relevance of a donkey? Well, donkeys are all over roads. You have to take a donkey if you so want to it's go. A, it's a symbol of roads, a donkey. Yeah, donkey, yeah. You expect me to really Eat-aw. be grateful for this. Eat-aw. They make a Eat-aw. lot of noise. Eat-aw. They make a lot of noise. If, in fact. Did you get um, a ride on a donkey then well, while you were there? Well, do you know, I didn't because uh, we were, we felt it would be cruel, but um, they, they would take you up to the Acropolis, which yeah. is right on top what of the hill. What else is in this envelope? That's that can't it. be it. That's it. What would you want else do you want? What else do you want? 
There's nothing else in there. That's, so that's it? That's a present, yeah. A cheap glass with a, 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 a not. matchstick donkey in the middle. No, it's on a beautiful a, On a bit of, of cheap art. chalk. It's a piece of so art. Rhodos on the front. Rhodos. Yeah, well, you know. It's I a mean, perfect piece of art for your collection. Uh, you, you know, know because I always bring you something back. Absolutely pathetic. Don't throw it, by the way, because... I'm not throwing break. it. I'm not throwing it. I mean, you know, I mean... My children picked that out for you. Did they, really? Yeah. 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 At the instruction of their father. No. Don't spend they anything... Said, Porky would like this. Don't spend anything over 50 drachma. It was, that either, it? It was either that. that. It? They're in the euro now. Mm. Did you not know that? Yeah, yeah. It's one of the reasons why they call it Grexit. Yeah, OK. Yeah, well, you know... I'll but it's either it. that or a fridge magnet. A fridge magnet. You got me a fridge magnet last in year. In Mexico, I got you that. Uh, Mexico, that's right, yeah. Well, you know... I, I, think, you should be, I think you're being quite ungrateful. Well, I mean, it's a pathetic present, to be honest. How is it? Well, A, it's not suitable for a man like me, a man of my stature. Why? You know, a man you of my... You can stick it on the dashboard in New my, Aston my, Martin. My, my, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Super glue. <laughs> look at my donkey. And then look at my donkey. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Shut up, but, donkey. Uh, but I mean, I can't think of any possible. Is it? A, what is it? It's a, it's a paperweight, is it? Yeah, well, it could be a paperweight. Yeah, you could use it for that. It can't be a paperweight. Do you know why? It's too why? light. Well, it's not made of anything substanti- substantial at all. Well, it's made of a you. bit of junk. Well, that's all right. It's a present. Bit of old junk, this is. It's, it's so a I'm souvenir. going to do with this? What are you going to do? I'm going to probably give it to my mother for Christmas. Really? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? But yeah, you're going to explain how you got to Rhodes because well, you're saying well, you didn't go to Rhodes. No, I'll scrape that off, right? And I'll say it's the Christmas donkey because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because actually it looks a bit like sort of biblical. It could be, yeah, <laughs> it looks a bit. Well, biblical. it's not far from the Middle East. I think Rhodes. I'll do that. You know, I you think I'll do, do that. that. Yeah, that's yeah, well, like the sort of the Bob. triumphant ride mm. into Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah. yeah, you can make it like a yeah. sort of a, a religious yeah. type thing. Might be able to make some use out of it, but mm. as a present to me, pathetic. I mean, hey, listen, I tell you what, I could say it's a wise man because. It's got a star. It so has. It's, it's a star on Well, it's got loads of stars. Well, there you go. It's stars. Well, so, I don't yeah, mind if you recycle it. The, uh, the three wise men, uh, you know, uh, got on the donkey and followed the um, the eastern star or whatever. Mm. And then all of a sudden... Now, it does, yeah, look, it does yeah. look a bit biblical. You're right. Yeah, yeah. So I might, I might have to do that. I might have okay. to dress up with something I else. Think it, I think it's nice. Well, I mean, yeah, I'd like to really say a big thanks, but yeah. a bit of junk like that, I'm not going to. Well, I don't see any present from you, for me. Well, I haven't been anywhere, have I? I've been holding you the fort You went to Manchester. Here. Why don't you buy me something from there? Oh, yeah, like what? I don't know. Like uh, maybe a, a DVD by... Uh, Liam Gallagher. Oasis, yeah, or Liam Gallagher or something like that. Did you like see that. him up there, by the way? Was no. he at the game? Uh, I think he was at the game, but, uh, of course, I was down on the pitch with the, my celebrity friends oh, and yeah. didn't deign to come down. <laughs> so there's nothing I could do about that, isn't there? No. Right, well, this is going back in the envelope yeah, now. there you go. The cheap envelope, which very I... Very expensive I, envelope. It's actually. got a very cheap bit of sellotape on it as well. I presume yeah. it's been recycled and used before. And, uh, yeah, well, all I can say is that's your idea of a present, mm. then... Don't well, it's better than a bottle of tea, know, isn't it? Don't hold your. Well, don't forget, you gave me a bottle of tea. Yeah, but that was only that was only to facilitate mm. the handing over ceremony. I see. You eventually got the whiskey, didn't you? Well, yeah, but there's not much point in putting whiskey did back into whiskey? a bottle. I did, but it you sure poured, didn't steal the well, whiskey. It was poured back into a bottle well, that had had tea in it. Well, you know, I can't help that. It was a question of timing and facilitating. Absolutely shocking. Yeah. Well, you know, shocking. Well, I'm. I, I. I think your attitude to the whole damn thing is. I mean, all you did is pick up a bit of tat and say that'll do for Porky. Well, that's no not true. In it whatsoever. Luke says here, uh, what about an ungrateful get? Paul no, is. no, I'm not. I just think that you, you know, consider the years we've been together mm. and, uh, you know, how we work solidly, uh, you know, to to make the two mics what it is. Yeah. I would have accepted a bit more than this filthy old bit of junk. <laughs> OK. Well, that's that's what you're getting. So there yeah. you are. You should be happy with that. Uh, coming up very shortly, though, it's Ask Porky. So if yeah. you need any advice uh, on how to be grateful, uh, don't ask him that question. Across the UK, online and on DAB. The two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. Well, when I was younger, so much younger than today. I never, I never needed anybody's help in any way. Now, but now these days are gone, days I'm gone. not so self-assured. Now I find, now I find a change of mind. And that music can only mean one thing, of course. Yeah. Uh, we have got quite a lot of uh, people tweeting in saying how ungrateful you are, by the way, about that uh, rather nice little souvenir well, I mean, of they, Rodos. They, they haven't seen the junk yet. But, well, yeah, uh, well, you I'm, can I'm, take a picture of it and put it out if uh, you like. Well, I am also delighted mm. that we have uh, videoed the handing over ceremony. 
and people will now be able to understand yeah. exactly what my gripe is. All right, well, we'll do that a bit later on because right now that music tells me mm. that it is time for Ask Porky. Yes. Now, this is a place where you get the chance to ask uh, the porkmeister a question yep. and he can give you uh, an exclusive answer mm. tailored personally mm. to your own uh, uh, situation. And what we'll try to do here is get through as many as we can yes. as ever uh, because, of course, uh, we've got a lot going on. Uh, and let's start off with one from Twitter uh, by, t- by Pete mm. uh, who says, if you had only one choice, you could either keep the new aircraft carriers or keep cycle lanes in London, which ones would you keep? Well, that's a very leading question because people know my views on both of those. Of course, we keep the new aircraft carrier, put some aeroplanes on it, make it into a a proper warship that will um, help us to uh, contribute to all the NATO plans of which the president, uh, Donald Trump, has announced some um, in the last 48 hours in a very controversial week for himself. Mm. And of course, I don't like uh, bicycle lanes because I think they steal too much road space. Uh, for too many of the 24 hours. I yes. don't mind the bike lanes being there, you know, at peak hours, but to close down those roads for the rest of the, the day and night is a scandal. OK, now, obviously, we've got a lot of, uh, of, of action around some of the things that were going on over the last week or so. Uh, some news stories, some not necessarily news mm. stories. How mm. about this from Stephen, though, uh, vis-a-vis tomorrow? Uh, he says, is there a weather spoons near TalkSport so that Mike Parry can get his nutritious fish and chips on Friday between the two shows that you're doing? Uh, no, there isn't. But what you'll find is that at most what we call football, areas of London, you'll find a weather spoon. So, for instance, at most um, major railway stations, you'll find one either in there or very close by. You and I have been in one in uh, Liverpool Street, for instance, uh, on our way to Tottenham Hotspur, if you remember. There's a big one at Victoria yes. Station. In fact, did you not see... I, yeah. I tweeted out a piece, actually, that somebody right. wrote based there right. uh, last week about you know the, the difference in the way that people now drink around the clock. Yes, that's right. And they, and they do. It opens very early. And, and, and in most um, areas of London, I, there's one I use sometimes when we go over to a publishing house that we're uh, talking to, and that's on uh, Southampton Row. Oh, yes. There's a big one there. OK. Mm. Uh, now, here's one from uh, Paul. He says, uh, my question for Porky is, do you ever go on holidays, not including the holidays where you either gate crash or attend weddings? Um, well, not really, because... I can't see the point of going on holiday unless uh, there's a purpose to that holiday, if you see what I mean. Yeah. I mean, for instance, if I said to you, um, look, I've decided next time you go on holiday, I'm going to take off to the Caribbean for yeah. a week. Mm. What would I do in a week? I, you know, I don't want to sit on a sun lounge well, next to just, a swimming pool for a week. Well, you just told us that you're thinking about sort of, you know, spoiling yourself a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, you can pamper yourself. There's all kinds yeah, of manner of things I could, you could do. I could, but, you know, I'd rather do it in the company of other people. Mm. I mean... I regard myself as the luckiest man in the world to have travelled around the world to yeah. some pretty, uh, you know, good, exotic, yeah. different and important locations, but always because there was a purpose of going there, yeah. and that was to report on the story that was happening there. True. So for that, I have to have a purpose. I can't go anywhere without purpose. OK. Sarah says this, the UK police have got more than 20 million facial recognition images, nearly one third of the population yeah. on their database. Uh, is it a good issue of security uh, or is it an invasion of privacy? I find it very secure. When I see cameras on lampposts in the streets and all that, and I think that that camera's filming me, that makes me more secure because mm. I don't do things wrong in society. So if I'm not doing anything wrong, what's the problem with being um, um, filmed on a camera? It's there to catch people who are doing things wrong. I, I find no uh, invasion of privacy in my life at all if a camera's filming me. Well, there I'm was doing. that case, wasn't there, just before I went away with the jogger yeah. on Putney Bridge? Yes. And they arrested the guy and yes. turned out it wasn't him. It, yes, but they eliminated him very, very quickly yeah. because he said I wasn't here. Yeah. Uh, and as for the facial recognition thing, by the way, I, I, um, I have some information that they will very, very quickly, the villains, get over the facial recognition problem yeah. by changing the face mm. or changing the iris or changing the fingerprint. They're, yeah. they're not... Well, um, if they're master criminals, but not if yeah. they're just all average well, Joe-type criminals. Well, right? it starts, doesn't it, with a thin tapering of the wedge. Mm. A thin tapering of the wedge. Mm. Max says, do you think drivers should be given points for going under the limit? Uh, for example, people doing 40 in a 60 zone. No, that's a mad thing to do. You've got to understand, we've got to, ex- we've got to raise the speed limits in this country. Do you not realise, in a country like Britain, which is a small country and well, doesn't no, have enough saying, roads. No, but he's saying should people be penalised for not driving at the speed limit? Oh, I see. Well, I thought it. you said give them bonuses for driving no, no, at no. the speed limit. Should they be given points? Yes, they should. Yes, I like that. I like that. Yes, that's very good because if you don't keep up with speed, you've got to remember for every one mile an hour we could raise the speed limit in this country, yeah. it would be worth about 10 billion a year to the British economy. Mm. So if you got up from 70 to 80, you're talking about another 100 billion a year into the economy. Uh-huh. That is something we vitally need and must be instituted as soon as possible. Okay, Uh, here's one from Lee. Did MG succumb, in your words, to a cigarette on his holidays? 
No, I don't think you did. I didn't, no. I think I would have known if you had. Yeah, that's I think I'd have seen right. that look in your face. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Anthony says, this is another one about me. Hi, Porky, do you think old loaf face will ever like Northerners? I'm from Manchester, yeah. and I find his southern bias annoying. Yeah. It's a good job of the secret of truth and justice yeah. puts loaf in his fa- in his place. Well, yeah. Anthony, I don't dislike Northerners. This is just another calumny no. uh, that has been no, perpetrated by not. Mr. Parry. You do he claims that I Northerners. don't like people from Northern England, which is absolute rubbish. More and more as I get older, I like going back to the North because I come from Chester, beautiful city and all that, but the attitude of Northern people towards uh, yourself, towards strangers, towards their neighbours and their friends is so totally different to the attitude in the South. I prefer the northern interpretation of comradeship. The northern powerhouse, eh? Of comradeship, oh, yeah. yeah, Mr Osborne excluded, uh-huh. uh, better than the South. I see. Uh, how about this from Jonathan? As a naval man spending a lot of time in London, mm. when was your last time down at the Maritime Museum in Greenwich, brushing up on your naval history? Um... It, was, it wasn't recently, but the last time I was there, it was because I was invited as the guest speaker to the uh, PR division oh, yeah. of the Armed Forces, really? Navy, Army and Air Force. What, at Greenwich? And, uh, at Greenwich Naval College. Really? And gave a speech in the Painted Hall. About um, what? About uh, communications between the military and the press. Really? Yes. And the Painted Hall is where, in fact... Uh, Admiral Lord Nelson... What are you laughing at? What's your problem? Well, because I wish I'd been there to hear that. Admiral Lord Nelson's coffin lay in state after the Battle of Waterloo. you mean a slave master? No, no, no. There's no slave mastery about uh, (laughs) Horatio. And, um, and I presume you're going to be chaining yourself to Nelson's column at some truly, point truly, to stop them knocking it down. It's right? truly a magnificent location, and yes, I have served there with distinction. Served, yes. OK. You've served in a lot of places. Kira says this, uh, Please ask Porky, why am I drinking a cup of tea when I don't like it? I prefer black coffee with no sugar. I've no idea. Strange question. I've no idea. If you don't like tea, don't drink it. Mm. Drink uh, black coffee with sugar and don't send me pointless questions because other people need important questions answered. Okay, now here's one from Ian. This is an important question. Will the Porky Quiz be on Talk Sport or Talk Radio tomorrow? It will be on Talk Radio. Yeah. And it will be at this time tomorrow, Friday. What's it going to be on, though? Well, we will release that uh, nugget of information a bit later. In the next few hours. In the next few hours. Maybe we should do uh, do a Twitter poll. Maybe with a few choices. No, 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 I'm not having that. No, oh, no, no, no. We cannot cede responsibility for the Porky quiz. OK. okay. Well, we did it last week, didn't we? Because David asked this yeah, question. Yeah. Uh, Porky, did you take out that newsreader you were trying to chat up last week? Uh, I think he's referring to Victoria. Talking about Ball. Victoria. Yeah. I wasn't trying to chat her up. I had a very professional relationship really? with Victoria, who turned out to be an outstanding uh, compatriot and comrade in your absence. She's outstanding and it's outside the studio. At the I moment. know, I know. Uh, how about this one from Kelly? Do you think it's inevitable that the government will introduce some form of road tax for cyclists? Well, they should do. Cyclists don't have any insurance. They don't have any road tax. They don't contribute anything to the roads upon which they drive. But most of all, they, uh, they in my view, are reckless in the extreme. And I might point out to you a very, very tragic case that uh, just concluded at the Old Bailey yeah. of a young mother who uh, worked in uh, the HR industry and mother of two and a wife who was knocked down and killed by a cyclist yeah. who was driving no around. Brakes. Uh, no front brakes. He was driving around on a bike designed for an Olympic track and knocked for the roads mm. who mutilated her so badly she had no chance of living after being taken to hospital. No, indeed. Shocking case. Now, we were talking about Manchester a moment ago. Johnny says, I'm off to Manchester for the bank holiday weekend and into next week from someone who lived there, i.e. you. Mm. Could you give me an idea of the best sites to see? Well, Manchester is a cultural icon, and that is that the dark satanic mills, which created the wealth for the expansion of the British Empire, uh, which made us the workshop of the world, uh, nothing to do with slavery. That was uh, something we abolished in this country 100 years um, earlier. Uh, Can I just say that there is so much there to see architectural-wise? I wouldn't know where to start, but... You know, go to Liverpool and go to the art galleries, go to Manchester and go to, you know, their cultural heritage centres. You'll have a great time. OK, and one from Pierre who says, Dear Porky, how do you make the perfect cup of tea? I always struggle. I, I don't struggle at all. You put a tea bag in the bottom of the cup and then you boil the kettle, but let it come off the boil, right? Yeah. And then pour it in and then you swish it round with a, like a large spoon and then leave it for three minutes. Three minutes. Yeah, and then you take the tea bag out and it becomes the perfect cup of tea. OK, and do you put the milk in afterwards? Of course, before? of course. You never put the milk in before. Do you know what I couldn't stand in America? They often mm. served you a, a cup of uh, tea with a plastic uh, lid on the top yeah. but with the, you know, the, the, the tag to the tea bag over the edge of the cup yeah. and the tea bag's still in there you with know, the milk people, in there as well. Yeah. Couldn't stand that. So you, know they, you know what they do in India, which is quite off-putting, is what? they bring you a pot of tea yeah. but they put the milk in the pot. 
So when they're pouring it out... Oh, it's already it, milked. It looks a weird colour. Yeah, I bet it would, yeah. That's, and it tastes all right, but it yeah. just they put the sugar and the milk in the pot. Yeah, OK. So that must be a pot for one, obviously, because some people don't take sugar and well, milk. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's if you yeah. ask for it in a, hotel, yeah. in a hotel. Sure. Uh, final one here from Richard, which I suppose is opposite to yeah. our situation. Yeah. Uh, Porky, how much did you really miss MG? I didn't at all. <laughs> I found it liberating. Did you? I found it uh, enhancing. Did you? I found it um, a relief. Did you? I found it somewhat... Um, but did you have anybody to argue with? Wonderful. Well, I did. I had a Victoria to argue with, you know, and she was uh, a very feisty uh, combatant. She was quite rude to you. Uh, no, not really, not really. I didn't take offence or she anything She said like you that. were a small, angry man. Well, she can say that if she wants, but everybody's small when they're sitting down. And I was sitting down opposite. I was sitting right. in the very seat you're sitting in. Okay. So, no, no problem there whatsoever. But all I didn't right. miss you at all. Okay. In fact, I wouldn't be at all averse to you pushing off uh, <laughs> next week for another uh, ouzo bladderated yeah, well, uh, I wouldn't be averse to it trip to uh, Rhodes. We may have to come up with, well, since you're in uh, such a generous mood, yeah. uh, perhaps what we should do is you can just pay me not to come here and I'll just go and uh, live yeah. in Greece. Yeah, How about good that? idea. When I flog my house, you mean, yeah. give you a bit of the yeah. dodge and I'll push off. Yeah, I'll yeah, just push idea. off and leave you alone yeah. Yeah. to yeah. be the master of your own dis- destiny. Yes. Yes. That was us, Porky. We are the two mics. The 21st century dream team of dialogue, debate and discourse. The two mics on Talk Radio. We'll get you talking. I'm going slightly mad. I'm going slightly mad. It finally happened, happened. This is Talk Radio. We are the two mics. We'll be back tomorrow, of course, at 10 o'clock. John Holmes is going to be here in a little while. Then today from four, uh, Sam Delaney's Live at Drive show will be broadcast from the bottom of Grenfell Tower in West London. Mm, It certainly will. Um, What did you say? Sorry. I'm just (laughs) telling you about uh, Sam Delaney's Live on Drive show coming from Grenfell Tower. Yeah, it certainly will be. You're absolutely right. Sam's chatting with uh, GCSE results people. Uh, fitness uh, people as well, Mm -hmm. and we'll try to find out what's happening with the Kensington Chelsea Borough Council and the Grenfell Inquiry. Absolutely right. All this and much, much more on Live at Drive with Sam Delaney from 4 until 7. It's only here, and of course it's on Talk Radio. It is indeed. Now, Rob has sent in a rather nice picture here. He says, when Porky mentioned about the wise men on the trail to find the star, Mm. this is actually what he meant. Mm. There's a picture of you looking for a pub called The Star. (laughs) Yeah, it's my (laughs) local pub in Gospel. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Blimey. Well, he's got got that one, right? There's some as well, Um, by the way. And here's one from uh, Edo, who says, can I get a shout-out for the Malagays? We are all off to sunny Barcelona tomorrow to get bladderated for a few days. Yes, well, you know, remember, it's bladderation in moderation Mm. is the theme of uh, this song, but uh, I'm actually... Uh, delighted that you're going to uh, Barcelona because when a city gets hit by the sort of uh, terror and tragedy yeah. that hit Barcelona whilst you were away, I think, wasn't it? Yes, it was. was yeah. you were away. Uh, the, first, the first thing you should do is get out there quick and show the solidarity and support mm. which civilised people in this world well, the feel other prob- towards the others thing, and, against and, and, terrorism and, and barbarism. That's right, and we haven't mentioned that because everybody's yeah. been down Las Ramblas at yes. one point or other in their life, you yes. know? Yes, yes, And absolutely. that's where it all happened. Mm. Uh, Nat says, I don't blame you for getting him a snow globe as Paul, he did get you a bottle of cold tea for mm-hmm. your birthday. Uh, mm-hmm. Hashtag plank. And Kira says, how ungrateful Mike Parry is. Yeah. He should be grateful that you got him a present at all. Really? Yeah, should I? Have mm. you seen the present yet? Well, Lee says, perfect present for Porky, a donkey yeah. for a donkey. Yeah, well, you know, I will take those sort of slightly uh, offensive, but uh, nevertheless unintelligent well, how about comments. This? Uh, in, uh, you know, I treat them with contempt. Ross says, contempt. a few old ruins. What a beautiful assessment of a cultured country. Mm. I bet the Greek folk are flattered by Porky's viewpoint. I was quite astonished the first time I went to the Acropolis. Right. Is that the one on the hill? That's the one above Athens, yeah. That's right, yeah. Well, funnily um, enough, an Acropolis is actually it's the Parthenon you're thinking of, isn't it? That's the Parthenon. Because Parthenon. an Acropolis is basically just a high uh, building above, right. above a sort of a fortification. Yes, that's because right. Because in, in Lindos, funnily enough, mm. they have they have got one, mm. and it's called the Acropolis. The Acropolis, and yeah. It's very, very high up. It was very hot there. It was about 31, 32 degrees. Yeah, yeah. And we took the view that if we were going to go up to see what yes. was going on up there, because yes. it's been there since like uh, three centuries BC. Yeah, it has, yeah. But it's fallen to bits, the one in uh, Athens. Well, they all are. Yeah, because well, they're well, all. They very old. do something to put them right then, well, shouldn't they? Well, they try to, but yeah. I mean, one of the problems they've suffered over the years is people taking souvenirs home, yeah, taking w- bits of them away. Yeah, well, yes, but I mean, we had that in this country with Hadrian's Wall. We had a terrible problem with Hadrian's mm. Wall, and it would have all gone by now if we had not got uh, heavy with these people in yes. the 19th century and, yeah. and started locking them up mm. for nicking the uh, what was left of Hadrian's Wall, well, which we to, did, by the you way. You don't want to nick people for, 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 for yes, that. Yes, you do. You? It's a heritage. They're stealing the country's mm. heritage. Of course right. you do. Yes. What would you do? Was there not a story of some a bunch of people doing that up in the north of uh, Scotland. What? 
Well, nicking uh, heritage and sort of vandalising property. Well, they what happened is they got into this place. Uh, it's the Outlander fans, isn't it? The Outlander fans went to this uh, like this village somewhere mm. in Scotland where they've got a stone circle. Yeah, you know, like the Avery Stone yes. Circle. You and I both I like know the in Avery Wiltshire. Stone yeah, circle. I a very do nice well. pub right next to them. Uh, what's it used it to be frequented by a lot of Hell's Angels. Actually. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I thought it was in the barge, was it? Uh, not the barge. No. No, that was in Scene. Uh, that's right. Yeah. That was very nice. Uh, well. I thought I thought I thought it was quite interesting the old uh, Avery, particularly as um, one poor bloke who uh, fell into the foundations of one of the stones. Oh, yeah. They couldn't get him out. Why? Because the sides were too steep. Mm. So they just how did he fall in? He, well, he's a workman. Oh, and, I see. And they were digging this huge uh, hole to put the you know the equivalent of their Stonehenge type thing in. Right. But he fell in so deep they couldn't get him out. What are you doing recently? Oh no no no! This was built like two thousand years ago. <laughs> you know, same time as Stonehenge. What are you talking years about? Ago. Well, what I'm saying is, these guys were digging this big pit. How do you know a guy fell into it? Because I've 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 read the history of it. They, You've read the history yeah, of the Avery Stone. Yes, I have. Yeah, sure. Yes, I'm sure. Of course, I'm sure. And a, and a bloke, you weren't stone. A bloke doing fell it. in, and in those days, they didn't have any way to get people out of deep holes. Right. They didn't have any ropes, basically. Didn't they? No. Well, how did they get the stones into the holes? Well, it, it's the same. they had ropes. It, well, they had, like, yeah, sort of ropes, but not very good ropes. <laughs> and so when a bloke fell in and they were right. just about to slide the, the stone in, right. they tried for a couple of hours to get him out and they couldn't. And the foreman just said, put the stone in anyway. So I'm afraid he got buried under the did stone. He? Right. Yeah. Do you remember when uh, they tried to reenact the movement of the Stonehenge stone? Yes. Because they worked out because of the blue nature of the yeah, colour. They came from Wales. Well, they came from Wales, yeah. right? And they reenacted this thing. And I think it was paid for by. BBC Wales, who decided to do this big sort of reenactment, right? Is that when the boat sunk? Yeah, because yeah, they brought this like stone. Boat, yeah. They got it all the way to that's the sort right. of Bristol Channel. That's right. Then they put it on a boat. Mm. And, and so this boat... is how they transport it yeah. across the water. And they got about five yards into the river. And the boat and it sank. Just sank. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Speaking of Wales, by the way, mm. have you seen this ridiculous story on the front page of the Times this morning? It drives me mad. Two former BBC executives who mm. used government money to set up a film production company mm. paid themselves almost £1.4 million. Pounds yes despite making a loss in their first year. Yeah. These are two women, Julie Garner and Jane Tranter, who yeah. apparently are claiming the sort of all the uh, kudos yeah. for restarting an interest in Doctor Who, yes. which is all filmed down there. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But incredible. This is what happens to public money in I these know. kind of places. I know. It's, remember we talked about the chap called Graham Bovey recently? Yes. Started the company, borrowed a load of money from the bank, yeah. paid it all out to, in, you know, allegedly in dividends to himself. Did he loans. also loan it to Anthony oh, Turner? absolutely. Who is his wife. Yeah. Uh, non-repayable That's loans right. and all that. Yeah. And, when the bank questioned it, it said, well, don't worry, I'm going to make £50 million. Yeah. But didn't. Went into liquidation. Right. The loans weren't repayable. Well, I mean, in this case, know, right, yeah. uh, all of these, uh, th- all of this money that went to these two women mm. to start up this high-end yeah. television uh, and film business, yeah. right, yeah. Uh, was all guaranteed by the money from the Welsh Assembly. I know. So they didn't actually have to bother putting any money of their own in. No, they didn't. She was given a loan of £270,000. Mm. Uh, her relocation cost to Britain from Los Angeles were paid to the tune of £300,000. To set up a company from mm. which she only was going to benefit. Yeah. It's unbelievable. It's incredible. And when you think well, So that... why do you need three hundred grand to relocate from LA to Wales? I've, I've no idea, but this was all to set up a production company for, yeah. quotes, high-end, right? That's right. There's a company called Shine, mm. which was started from nothing. As that was a Elizabeth TV... Murdoch's company, uh, wasn't uh, it? Yeah, and, and I think it made about £150 million quid. Yeah. But it was all financed by private money. Yeah. It wasn't public money being no. pumped into it. Well, that's ridiculous, that's, that's, that's where the competitive edge will all always win over public money. Yeah. There's no desire to make public money pay. Well, all these people but want to you're... do, presumably, is take the public money yeah. and, and have a very nice life, thank you very much. Well, surely in, in like uh, three years' time, when the Welsh Assembly come back and say, how's it going? Yeah. It's not working. Sorry. Well, how about this, right? How about this? You know a bit about numbers. Yeah. A turnover of £1.8 million, pounds, mm. right? Gross profit of 520000 yeah. However, all of that was dwarfed uh, by uh, a, a loss that the company made uh, of £3.7 million pounds yeah. because of administrative expenses. Yeah. Three point seven million in administrative yeah. expenses for a of, company that hasn't made a program yet. That's a lot of bus fares it's around very, Cardiff yeah, Bay. That's very hard. Yeah. Mr. John Holmes is here. Good, good evening, good, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon to you. gentlemen. Uh, how are you? Uh, we're very well. Very well indeed. Thank you. Normally our paths don't cross anymore because you often sort of sit in for me. Well, you did sit in well, for you right. for a little while. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes, we well, did. here we are. Well, our paths are crossing today yeah. and tomorrow, yes. indeed, and possibly Monday. Indeed. If you're here for that. Indeed. What have you been up to? Um, I keep hearing about you going off with gorillas. Th- there was a gorilla incident. That was, was a while ago. Yeah, we made a documentary. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Well, I went well, to well, Rwanda. When's, to, when's it coming so out? That's well, where they are, isn't it? Yeah. I've got to go to Rwanda. Up the mountain. Yeah. It went out. It went out on here some time ago. Oh, you really? made a documentary yeah. for the radio? Yeah. Oh, you didn't oh, film it? No. Well, I filmed bits of it, but yeah. only Well, surely only you want to film a way. documentary yeah. about gorillas, don't yeah. you? Yeah. I like the noise of gorillas more than the look of gorillas. I was about yeah. to say, you must have a load of gorilla noises, which, which uh, 
should use as a theme, maybe, for your show. You I know learned as I mean? a... But could you not just... Uh, oh, 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 that's Tarzan you're well, That's Tarzan, yeah. 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 Surely, oh, um, based on if you did that to a gorilla, it would punch you. I think. Surely yeah, you could have yeah. just put a load of gorilla noises on. You didn't have to go anywhere. Did have to, they could have just made it up. Sound yeah. effects. You don't know that I didn't do that. I don't know. In fact, I suspect that you didn't do uh, what you say, say you did. <laughs> yeah. What are you doing this afternoon? Uh, well, you were talking about numbers just there. We were. We'll be talking about them in a GCSE way. Because that's confusing, isn't it? Because they're still called GCSE. My son's school actually sent us a letter to say that nobody in the educational business will now know whether today's results or next year's results are any different or better yeah. because they can't compare the two. And in the old days, if I think if you did, I was hearing something about this this morning, if you did CSEs, if you got a nine, that meant you failed. Yeah. But if you now put those results down in a recent CV, you're going to look like you were top of the tree. So yeah, it's right. going to help people who are thick. Yeah. Well, well, there's a lot of thick people in this country. <laughs> That's right. As I've noticed, having just returned from a place where there's a lot of enlightened, creative people. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, Greece, really? Is, yeah. is that why yeah. Greece is the basket case of Europe then, in terms of Greece the economics? Greece is not the basket case of Europe It at certainly all. has been over the last yeah. few years, mate. Well, that was just because a lot of bright is... people as yeah. they're running Greece. Eh? There's a lot of very clever people in Greece. Yeah. yeah. The reason yeah. they got screwed was because Goldman Sachs got hired by the Germans really? to tell everyone that they were in good shape. Are you sure, economically? it wasn't anything to do with the fact that Greek people don't pay taxes, don't like paying taxes. Well, that's make, that's I'd make like some... to retire at 35 when the bus some... drivers. Well, that makes them. Clever. Nothing. In my view, that makes them clever. But it bankrupt the country. They didn't. It did. They've no. got nice cheese. They haven't got very nice cheese Feta's at all. Feta's lovely. Uh, Feta's all right. Mm. I met a guy there who said, I'm so bored with Feta cheese. He's Greek. <laughs> mm. He yeah. said, uh, you know, that's why they make Feta pie now. Mm. Mm. Because it's one oh, of the yeah. few things you can do with Feta that doesn't <laughs> taste like a Greek salad. <laughs> anyway, John oh, Holmes uh, is coming up uh, after the news right here on Talk Radio. Coffins don't have pockets. Uh, what? Coffins don't have pockets. <laughs> 